Hey everybody, this is Geneva of Geneva's Closet Talk Show. Please make sure you like and share this video and subscribe to Geneva's Closet if you haven't already done so right here on YouTube. And you can follow me on Facebook at what? At Geneva's Closet. And you can email me at Geneva's Closet 22 at gmail.com. Now, let's get into this interview. Hey everybody! Look, I was trying to say it all, you know, just like how I do on my intros and stuff when I pre-record my videos. I was like, let me try to say it like that because I always say it a little differently. But how's everybody doing? How y'all doing? Happy Friday. Happy Friday, happy Friday, happy Friday. First of all, let me start off by saying that excuse if there is any audio issues today or anything else, people like there's a lot that I'm going to have to be sitting up here maneuvering and doing for this interview with Miss Essie Berry. And I am talking about the widow of Fred Rerun Berry. Y'all know who Fred Rerun Berry is? Remember he was on the show, What's Happening? Remember him? And do you also, and then look, there you go. There you go right there. Remember him? And my girl is, is you know, she was married to him up until he passed away and the funny thing is i've been friends with her now for four years now we're going on five going on five years and we have never did this interview not a once have we ever took the time to talk about mr fred rerun Barry, their relationship what transpired what do she know about him and his family because i haven't really heard too much about his family his wives the kids just give us a tea. But then again, who is Miss Barry? That's another thing that we want to know. Who is Miss Essie Barry? Now, we know that she is the widow of Fred Rerun Barry, and she also says that she's a civil rights activist. Y'all know what I'm talking about, because she be sitting up there talking about that she got a 100% winning rate. But we're going to ask her about this 100% winning rate. And then she says that she is a master cosmetologist. Well, what exactly has she master cosmetologist this? You know what I mean? Let us ask her, because she's the only one that knows the answers to these things. So let me bring her in, the lovely and the beautiful and those so talented and outspoken, Miss Essie Bear. How you doing, Miss Barry? Wait a minute. Let me unmute her. Let me unmute. How you doing, girl? Hey, beautiful. How are you? First of all, when you be getting my in my introduction, I'm like, who the hell is she talking about? But I love your introduction and I love the music that y'all hear that music, don't y'all? Y'all hear it, don't you, in the background? Um, I want to thank everybody for coming on today with me and Geneva. Um, I don't know how many parts we're going to do with this, but it's going to be a lot that you guys didn't know, um, some things that you may have known, but these are things that I know politically correct for myself. So I'm looking forward to like spreading the tea. And let me tell you something. I did get everybody um, a lot of questions. And, and if I can't answer them tonight because we can get through this, I'll do a specific video just for that if we don't answer on these videos, okay? And I think that young lady right there is one of them. So I welcome everybody in the box. Let's go, beautiful. Hey, I think the first thing that I do want to say before I get started with the interview with Miss Barry is that I am supporting a black owned business called Girl Gift Tees. If you are looking for T-shirt, custom-made shirts for like reunions, birthday parties, graduations, vacations, whatever. Or you just want to check out what she has already created. This is one of the shirts right here. 100% chance that I don't care because that's basically how I be feeling, people. You know what I'm saying? But here go the shirt right here. She sent me this. Again, this is Girl Gift Tees. You can check her out on Amazon. I'm putting the link inside the chat. I will be putting the link after this video is done. Go over there. Check her out. Girl Gift Girl. Girl Gift Tees, she has custom made shirts and already lovely shirts. I would advise you to click on the link because I have tried to go on Amazon and just put her name in, Girl Gift Tees. And for whatever reason, I had a hard time finding it. So click the link, go over there. I think she said her shirt star $20 and under. $20 and under. 
Yeah, right. And then I like the way it fits too. It fits good right here. Check that out. Check that. You know what I'm saying? So go over there, check that out. Okay, now let's us let us get to this interview. So, Miss Barry, uh, you know the first thing that I would like to know is, um, where are you born and raised, lady? Like, where you come from? Where does this lady come from? Um, I was born in Columbus, Georgia. Pretty much raised there. Half and half, but at like, I think about maybe seven, nine years old, I went to Detroit and I stayed up there to about maybe 12, 13 years old. And the rest of it's my time I did in Columbus, Georgia. Do you have any siblings? I do. How many siblings? I have an older sister. Um, I have two brothers right up under me. And I have a baby sister, a younger sister. Um, unfortunately, she's mentally retarded. She's a ward of the state to a degree. Um, I haven't seen in about 30 years, but I do. It's like five of us all together. No, let me take that back. And I have one other sister. Um, it's a long story. She's up in Detroit as well. She was one of the last children that my mother birthed that none of us got to meet. So it's actually three girls and two boys. So as two younger sisters, one older sister, and two brothers up under me. Okay, well, um, out of your siblings, how many of y'all did your mom and dad actually have together? Four. And so I know you said that you don't have a relationship with your sister. Is that with your mom and dad? Yes. Yeah. Um, yes, with my youngest sister. I would have a relationship with her, but it was things that transpired when we were younger, when we were abused and the doctors certified her as mentally retarded. I felt like sometime when I was around her, I knew she knew who I was, but because of so many things that transpired over the years, I have never seen my sister after, and my youngest sister after the abuse. I hadn't saw her. Not by choice, it's just what it was. Okay, so what about your other siblings? Um, I have a half brother by my father. Me and him are very close. I have a brother that I somewhat grew up with because at the age of 12 years old, I really didn't see my father anymore. Um, me and my older sister, we grew up um, for quite a bit together. We were probably one of the closest siblings out of all of us at one time or another. A lot of people when we were younger, we we're two years apart. They thought we were twins, but we weren't. Okay, so I mean, okay, so is your mom and dad still alive? Um, no, my mom died um, 2007, if I'm not mistaken, on Labor Day, and my dad is still alive. He's in Detroit. He's a minister. I'm a preacher's daughter. Believe it or not, what? I'm a preacher's daughter, a bishop's. Okay, so what was your relationship like with your um, parents? She can deep. Um, so let me see how I'll go. Um, my mom and dad was together for what I know when I was nine years old. I was in, um, I was like with my mom and dad. So my mom, at that time, my relationship was okay. But somewhere along the line, my mother had a mental breakdown. When she had that mental breakdown, uh, we were abused in Detroit, Michigan. We were considered one of the worst child abuse cases in Detroit, Michigan. My mother would cut our hair out with butcher knives, um, shoot at us with guns. She stabbed us, threw us downstairs. Whatever you could think, imaginally, that a person would do to you, it was done to us. And for that, you know, at, at nine years old, that's all I knew of my mother after that, the abuse. And with my father, I mean, I'm going to keep it real. I mean, well, I had a relationship, but I'm very outspoken. And like things to how he did things, I think they could have been done differently. Um, no disrespect. He can go good, whoever. But he was abusive to my mother. My mother loved this man so much that instead of being his ass, she came and abused us. And we were considered one of the worst child abuse cases. I was nine. My older sister was 12. And then you guys do two years after that with my youngest brother and my youngest sister. 
my baby sister at one time, from what I remember, she talked. And after we got abused, it was like she went into this dark space and she didn't come out. And um, after that, we all were removed out of the home one by one. And I can't say like in that time, I felt like my oldest sister got it worse than any of us. But then when she was removed out of the home, then it was me. So really to me, neither one of my parents ever really knew who I was. They just knew that I was their child and I was there for whatever reason. Okay, so how did you get out of that situation? So how did you end up getting out of, what age did you get out of there and how did you get up out of there? Age 12, I remember me and my sister went to school one day, my older sister. We were beat up really bad. We hadn't took baths. Um, my hair wasn't combed. It was like, it was really bad. And they separated me and her and we were trying to figure out what we were gonna say. Next thing I knew, they took her one place, me another. <clears throat> By the time I, this one, my mom abused us. Um, I got home. Michelle didn't come home with me. They didn't know where she was at. They had already took her. And I ain't gonna lie, I was so glad. I was so grateful because I used to hate how my mom used to beat her. I wish I could have took her for her, but I was taking my own beatings. And um, she was angry. And one night she tied me to a balcony because she was so angry. And she strapped my hands to the top of the bed, my feet to the bottom, and she would beat us in the stomach with two by fours. That's why I said, I'm a PO hit what I do because I survived a lot. And I didn't think I could have children. And one day my dad heard her and he ran up the stairs and I ain't gonna lie, he was finna choke her out. Then I was like, okay, do whatever. Cause I mean, I don't want to be abused anymore. And um, he sat at the top of the stairs with a gun to make sure that I slept that night but then that morning he had to go to work. And when he went to work, she went outside in a white and red gown, no shoes on, real cold outside, snow on the grounds. I was there with my baby sister and my brother because my, my older sister had been taken. And um, somebody called the police on her and my baby sister, my brother had eight. So when I was watching her out the window, because in Detroit there's, there's houses, but there's top floors. They got top and bottom, so you can always see. And I seen her, and I was her to feed my sister peanut butter crackers. Um, it was some raw fruit there. I was just trying, because they hadn't ate anything. Um, I remember some soda in a, a bottle. And so by the time I was through feeding them, we were still waiting for her to come, but she never came. Um, the police came, and... They came into the house. They took her to jail. They took me and my siblings and we all were separated. We were all separated in different locations. The first time we got abused by our mother and my dad at the time, how child abuse is now that what they had about child abuse. They didn't consider that then at that point. So I had to wait and the police took us out of the home and we all went to different foster homes until we could go with a, a relative. Oh, wow. So how long were you in the foster homes and how did you get out of that or end up going to a relative's house? I mean, so what happened after that, basically? Wait a minute. I didn't like any of the foster homes. One home, it was like these these dudes took us and took me and, and like what my dad when my dad couldn't come for some reason. I can't remember why. But like one time this lady had these kids and they were dudes and they took me down and they locked me down into a basement and I couldn't come out and I had eight for days. Nobody asked me what happened to me. I just had to live through that. And I set her house on fire. That's how I got the fuck up out of there. I set her house on fire because I didn't know what else to do. So when I see foster kids running and stuff, I know it's for a reason because foster parents just doing that to get a check. They don't worry about the kids. And then when I got back to my dad, he was still, it was like, you can't raise children and you a single man. So he had to kind of get married, but I didn't care for his wives because they were fake too. Um, I just had always been outspoken. So after we left the foster homes, he couldn't get custody of us right then. So so much was going on. I didn't understand it legally at the time. 
So I went with my grandfather, my older sister went with my grandmother and both of those on my father's side, my brother, my biological brother that we were raised with, not my half brother, my biological brother was raised with my father and he took my sister that was mentally retarded and he stuck her in a home and we couldn't see her. Now you said that you were always outspoken Okay, so you didn't start off quiet at first, you know, because sometimes a lot of people start off quiet and then they have endured things in their life that cause them to speak up and be outspoken. But you said that you were always outspoken. Well, I knew I was outspoken, right? Because I just like to have fun. I just say what I feel. But when my mom abused me like she did, and I knew this Avon lady, she watched us getting beat like that. Like one time my mom took a bottle and threw it upside my sister's head because she caught us stealing food because we were stealing food. We had ate for like a week, me and my older sister. She made us stand up in the window, butt naked. And I was like, damn, can people see us? This I'm wondering in my head, not speaking out loud. And like she would cut our clothes off and then stand us up in the window naked. And I didn't know why. Or like one one and it was all in christmas time so like going through that and you're so bodily brutalized by someone that gave you birth to you or someone close it was like when i got away from that i said i would never be silent again i was always the happy go lucky blow everything off but i was straight to the point i'm not a fake person i always um said what i feel but you got to realize at nine years old, I, well, actually, yeah, nine years old, I didn't even see my biological mother anymore. Here I am going into a path with my father and then he's marrying women and you just want me to call her mother because you marry her. But I know who my mother is. And he, my father didn't like any of those situations. So it was like really like hard for me to determine like which way do I go or how, which, how should I be? But so many people took my kindness or my quietness for a weakness as I got older and I realized the abuse that I had went through, things would trigger out in my relationships, with friendships, with people that I would not let someone's like just devour me or come to me or raise your hand to me because that was always a sign of abuse. So when I was younger, I was pretty quiet. But when I hit 15, it was over with because I had went to foster care, went to family members, been shipped all around the world. Didn't nobody want to be bothered with us as children. So I had to become my own person. I had to become who I am by myself. Now, I know that when a lot of uh, kids are dealing with abuse, that it can kind of go two ways. They could either, um, you know, like not really understand what's going on, but still love their, you know, family but mom dad or whatever that's abusing them or hate them so what so so what did you make you know like get from that like your feelings being so young dealing with that did you hate your mom did you still love her and then you said that you didn't see her anymore um after you were nine years old so what did you think about that did, did you wonder where she was at what was what was going on with your mom um keep it at 100 my mom caught my dad cheating the lady that he cheated with she played with snakes i don't know what went on in my mom's mind after that but she started seeing us as snakes she would cut our ponytails off us because she saw us as snakes i didn't even know what to think because i watched a woman who loved everything about us would dress us from head to toe keep our hair braided hooked up 24 7 and in an inkling because of a man cheating it was like she we became the enemy or she saw us or she couldn't beat him so she beat us it was hard for me to understand how you could give birth to me and hurt my family and hurt my my siblings like this like one day my mom said i want you to stand up in the middle of the floor i said i gotta go use the bathroom mama she said no you can't use the bathroom i said please it won't take but a minute i said i just gotta go pee she said i don't want you to pee she said i need you to pee in the middle of the floor ain't no pot there while well, i'm a pee in the middle of the floor 
Next thing I know, she took a rifle and shot between my legs. Piss came running. I mean, it was automatic reaction because I still, you know, because I thought the next bullet would be me, not knowing that something like it was happening. Watching her throw ammonia in my brother's eyes, watching her put us at the top of the stairs and push us down the stairs, and we roll down the stairs like there's nothing wrong. And and why I couldn't even she couldn't even tell us why this was happening. I felt like she was more angry at my father than she was angry with me. But what I had to realize too is that was still my mother. It didn't stop me from loving her. How do I stop someone from loving someone that gave me all who I am? But at the same time, I had a problem with trusting women. I don't like two facing this. It was just a lot of things that I realized over the years of the abuse, what happened that it, it affected me later, but I was able to deal with it with no therapy. Like when she would keep us out of water, we would take baths at weeks at a time. I take 20 baths a day. I love being clean. I guess that's OCD. I'm, I, I'm like um, treated for that now as far as I am OCD because like they trying to say you shouldn't take that many baths. I have, I don't, I can't stop it because you really don't realize when you abuse like that, those things that happen to you, you don't know why you're doing them, but as age go on, you do. And people handle abuse differently. I was angry with my father for cheating on my mother because of the abuse that she did with us. But like when we got took away from her, one day she called me and she called my older sister. We was at my dad, mom house, my grandmother. I was named Essie after my father's mother because we looked alike, they said. And she she talked. She, everything she had did to me from the abuse, from the beating, from the cutting my hair out, shooting at us with guns, dragging us to name. She she told me that on the phone. So I'm like, like you really crazy, right? But you remember this like it was yesterday. I called my mother out her name, and I was wrong. Yeah, it was wrong. But at that time, I, I, I'm i just 12 years old, 13 years old, and you're calling me with this. So I cussed her out, and I didn't hear from her for years, for years, because it was done, you know, because I just felt like to remind me of the abuse that you tormented me with, you don't know what I went through in the process before I got to my grandmother's house. I was a young girl. I was a runaway on the streets. You know what I'm saying? I stayed on the streets almost seven months on the streets of Detroit. A prostitute found me and took me home um, because when my dad got married, I didn't want to I didn't want to be in his world because it was like you wanted me to call someone mama. If it's not your mother, we have a hard time doing it. But parents don't care. That's your stepmama. That's who I'm with. You call her that. I couldn't because I knew the truth. It didn't matter what my mother did. I just knew the truth. And I would have a problem with someone putting their hands on me, raising their hands at me, anything like that. That's a problem to me. So those things reflected who I am now as an individual and a woman. Deb, I think I answered that pretty much. Yes. Yes, you did, Miss Barry. You should. You, you absolutely did. So what happened at 15 years old? Did you say that you did? What at 15 years old? At, okay, so... This going to be deep. I got to go back. Okay, so you guys, when I got took away from my mother, my dad continued to try to get custody of us. But then he would marry, and one woman, I see them, I saw them physically, physically fighting. That was abuse to me. And then he married a minister, so he became a minister. But no disrespect, ministers do shite shit behind closed doors. You preaching in the gospel pulpit, but you beating on me with a belt, and I got black and blue marks all the way down me, up and down me, but I got to go sing in the church choir tomorrow. Is that what we doing? So my stepmom talked my dad into putting, keeping me in a juvenile because after we separated from my mom, 13, 14, um, Something went on and we were getting ready to get a beating and a lot of it's in the books too. So to let you guys know. So I'm kind of giving you a synopsis and I ran away because my stepmom told my older sister to go upstairs and get a pipe. So now you can't get no belt. You got to get a pipe to beat me with. In my mind, only thing I reflected is seeing that abuse that my mom did. My dad didn't even think about they ain't been on a therapy. We're not scared if she get beat, but I done beat by my mom. So you think I'm gonna let another woman beat me? So I ran away from home. 
I stayed on the streets of Detroit for over seven and a half months. A prostitute found me and took me home. She said, the only thing I want you to do, Essie, is keep my children from me and babysit. At that time, I didn't know what she did. I put two and two together later. And I love this lady from the day. Never saw her again after I left. Her name was Michelle. She had um, a son and a daughter. Her, her husband's name was Demetrius. So she would leave me there. Nobody knew where I was at. My dad was looking for me. And so one day dude came and he was drunk, but I ran away now because I didn't want to get beat with a pipe by my stepmother, which was a minister. And so her husband showed up. She wasn't there. So she wasn't there and dude was getting drunk. And all of a sudden I'm a virgin. Never been the first man I slept with was the first man I married. And he started like putting his hands on me. He pinned me down. I was like, oh my God. So you mean to tell me, Lord, I've been on the streets for seven months. You can let this man take my innocence. I couldn't even think straight. I got him up off me some kind of way, and I just took off running. I stopped by her sister house, told her what his raggedy ass had did, trying to rape me at 14 years old and trying to take me. And I ran, and I hid. And when I hid, some police found me. And they put me in a police car. Then it was like, um, we should just take her back in a job and beat her ass. And I got two white cops in the front of the car. I'm a little 14 year old black girl. And you talking about beating my ass on Detroit streets. So I took off running and I ran. They caught me. I went to a juvenile. I stayed in a the juvenile. There was nothing wrong with me. How I am now is who you see now. Um, my stepmother taught my father into putting me into a mental ward. And I was 12, 13 at the time, somewhere up in there, 14. I'm not quite sure. And now, mind you, I've already been beaten by my stepmother before, by my dad before, by my mom before. So I have a conflict with people putting their hands on me. I would rather run because if I put my hands on you, I already know I'm going to take your life. So no need of doing that. And I walked through this facility of a mental war place. The, the, the smell, I'll never forget it. The sounds, the cries, the screams. I'm 12, 13 years old. Listen to all this going on within this time frame. And they left me there for another seven months. So when I left the streets of Detroit, I went to a ward for seven months. Didn't know why I was there. Saw people playing with their fingers, their toes, their hands. And yes, it's hard for me to talk about, but I lived it. So let's tell it. And shit, I didn't know, y'all. I was in a, a mental ward at 12, 13 years old. So doing all this in this process, I'm like, why am I here? Sitting for seven months, I wanted to go home. I'm thinking I'm going to go home at Christmas. I didn't go home. My dad said, I don't want you there. My stepmom didn't want me there because I continue to run away because I didn't want to get beaten. And I don't know if y'all was seen, y'all flew over the cuckoo nest. I went over that mug up in there. I jumped on table, slaps. I went off. I went off. Like I was crazy. I went off, period, period. It took eight men to hold me down. Now I'm a, I'm a 12, 13 year old girl. And you're going to hold, got eight men holding me down. They shot me up something that you called hell dog. Now, when you see those mental retarded or you see people in those mental wars and they shooting them with all that medication, I'm telling you, that shit make them look like that. When they shot me up with this stuff and my dad never asked me what happened is mental war. Nobody ever asked me. They never cared. Um, they shot me up with hell dog. The eight men got up off me, pretty much couldn't breathe. When I shot me up with this hell dog, it really much calmed me down, but I was pissed because I wanted to go home. It was Christmas time. I stayed restrained to a bed for a week and a half. If you pee, they had to put the pot up under you. you. They didn't even barely wipe you. If you ate, one hand was released so you could sit up and eat. The other hand was still restrained to the bed. There was a nurse named Cheryl. When everybody would go off duty in this war, Miss Cheryl would come and release me from that bed. She would let me get up. She would let me stretch. And I never forgot her. She was so beautiful. And I, I knew she'd see my face. She would know me. And this facility of this war now, you guys in Detroit, it is closed. But after they restrained me for a week and a half, I never went off again for show. But 
there was something about this medication. It would lock you. It would make you look deformed. My mouth would frown. And I know people are going to laugh. It's funny now, but I'm just telling you because it wasn't funny then. My whole body would lock up like I was deformed. So my hand would jump up like this. My leg would jump up like this. And my mouth would frown like, and that's how that medicine, that shit took like a week and a half to get off me. I was sitting in the window and I was just singing gospel songs and I just asked God to get me out of it. One day my therapist came in, he said, I need to talk to you. He wanted to know why I went off like that because this is who I am. I wanted to show them what a crazy person exists of. I wanted to show them at my age, I knew what was right and wrong, but you want to play me and slap me in somewhere because you didn't want your step wife or my stepmom they bother with me hell i didn't even know why i was in there if you ain't gonna beat me with a pipe or hose pipes and shit then i wouldn't have ran away from home so i told the doctor you lay on the couch and let me sit on the chair one hour i was out that mental ward when i told him how i felt and it was a wrap okay now i'm trying to press these buttons there's a lot going on over here with the buttons Okay, so, uh, all right. I mean, so after dealing with all of that, because that's a lot. That is a lot that you had to endure. And then seeing how strong of a woman you are, oh, I just have to hear about the different things that you, you know, that you done did in your life. So how in the world did you be, so so how did you become a cosmetologist? Like, where did that come in at? You wanted to do hair. After I got abused by my mom, my dad sent me to his, his people and all this shit, all this happened. Um, I got out the mental ward and I had lied about a curling iron one day and they locked me up. My, my, my dad got mad and they beat me really bad. They beat me with a hose pipe. They beat me with a hose pipe. They told my sister and my brother to go in there and jump on me. They wanted me to do that to my siblings. I wouldn't do that. My oldest sister and my brother stomped me like somebody in the street. They beat me with a hose pipe. And then they put me in a tub of hot water. The next day I had to go to church and I had to sing like that. And my whole body was bruised. Everything was covered. But here, when I got from church that Monday after school, I went to my psychiatrist, my therapist that they sent me to. When I got to my therapist, my clothes were off and I was sitting on the couch just like this. I said, dude, this is like I'm crazy. I was messed up. My body was totally bruised from head to toe. They immediately, by the time I got to the house, my dad sent me, no, my dad didn't do it. The people sent me. The police was up and down my street. CPS, welfare, caseworkers, they, wrote, they, they locked the block down. They took me out the house. My bags were packed on the porch. My dad said, I'm done. I don't want to see you no more. I was good too because I ain't want my ass whooped no more with no hose pipes or being beaten and y'all preaching in a pool pit. But then you beat my ass before Sunday morning church. I had a problem with all that. So I ended up going to Georgia with his mother, which was my grandmother. And Michelle went first. And I went after Michelle. And at that time, um, my dad was sending money. Everything was going cool. But then he wasn't sending what he was supposed to. My grandmama got mad. She didn't want to take care of some more. Michelle said, F it. She just went on about her business, which is my oldest sister, living her best life. Um, but she was talking about putting me back in a juvenile, been there, gone there, done that. Nobody asked me nothing. All what I'm telling you, me being on the streets, my system don't even know this. What I'm telling all y'all today, nobody knows. This is my first time putting this out here like this. And my grandmother came to me and said, look, I can't keep taking care of you. It ain't right. Um, I can't afford you. A couple of times, my grandmother tried to sell me to old men. One time she tried to sell me to this old man, and I pretty much pulled his dingling out his socket. Don't take me there because I'll go there with you. How dare you? So I was like, damn, I'm going to have to give my virginity up to an old bummed out cat for $50. I'll pass. Um, I met my children's father in a project in Columbus, Georgia called Elizabeth Candy. We became friends. I read a biology book. I hadn't had sex. I probably would have never had sex if I had uh, not went through what I went through. But I said I had to figure a way to get out my grandmother's house because if not, they were going to put me back in a juvenile until I was 18 years of age. And why? Because you didn't want to be bothered because you wanted money. What was it? 
So I read a biology book. I was cool with my kid's father. I was sweet on him. And he was the first man I made love to, got into it. And both of my children are by him. I got married at 15 years old. What the hell did I know about marriage? Wait a what? 15 years old? Did you say you got married at 15? Yeah, what in the... Okay, and um, and so when did you have your... So what ages were you when you had both of your sons? They was two years apart, 15. And my sons are 34 and 36. I have a 34 and 36-year-old son. I was 15 when I think I had my own first son going to 16. Then I had my other one two years later. So I was a teenage mother. And, you know, my son gets upset, but I read a biology book. I was cool with him. I got pregnant. He married me, and it's what it was. So um, it happens, you know, <laughs> because you said your son gets mad, I guess, when she tell that story. So how long were you two married? We well, married about 12 years. He, But my kid's father, name is Bernard. Um, he was my first love. Um, we were together almost 12 years, something like that. Um, maybe, maybe more or less. I can't do the mathematics. Um, I was very close with his whole family. We became a family, the Jackson family out of Chi-Town. Cause someone asked me, did I get raised in Chi-Town? No, all my family members are from Chi-Town from my son's side. I can consider them my bloodline. Vice Lords, gang disciples, we there. You dig what I'm saying? I hold a stand on who they represent and where they from. I don't like per perpetrate. It's a lot of gangsters in my family, good, bad, and different. I love them all because they all bleed the same blood. So basically, his family became my family. And we stayed together until he started cheating. And his father came to me one day and he said, if my kids mother have been their grandmother have been half of the woman you would have she you are he said then we would still be together today he said what you gonna do let my son keep cheating on you he done cheated on you you've been with him almost 12 years what you gonna do make it 22 and then then what happens then you still gonna be going through the same thing he said do what you need to do to give my kid grandkids a better life from that coming from my kids grandfather and that was his daddy I went to uh, cosmetology school, I think 17, 18. I became a master cosmetologist and I'm a master cosmetologist for over 30 years. I can do any type of hair. I can do nails, toes, facials, makeup. I'm a beast at what I do. And I, when I do a hair show, what Geneva's showing right now, I'm a fantasy chick. When I do hair shows, I make it come to life. I can put clock, robot, trophy, bird cages. There's nothing that I can't do with hair. That's me right there that you see on that picture. That on my head, that was um, a hair show that I got and I did. Um, every hair show I've ever entered into, I've won. I've never lost a hair show unless it was rigged. When I go, I go to win. And in that time with me doing hair, I believe that those, those, those pictures, those hairstyles, it was an outlet for me. When I do hair shows, it became fantasy for me. It became a world that nobody could create, but I knew what I was doing, you know, and I think that was a world and a way for an outlet for me, you know, it's how you see those pictures up right there. That's how we went in there. We went in there with capes and hoods on. So when we come out, we give you a show. That right there, me dressed in that white, that outfit was sold and made by my godmother. I sew and make clothes as well. That hat is all hair. Everything you see, if you see any pictures of my stuff, I don't care what it looked like, that's hair on somebody's head. I don't think nobody can outrank me. And I don't want Bonner Brothers shows too. Yes, sir. All those outfits, all those dudes, that's all me. 30 years of it. And I'm a beast at what I do. And I don't think nobody going to call me out of no hair show. Those leather hats, all those brims, Geneva Sean right now, all oh, that's me. All oh, that's hair. That's me. I walk the walk when I talk it. There it is. Okay, wait a minute. Wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Because I got to say something. I got to say. Y'all can't see my face right. Wait a minute. Y'all can't see my face. But when, girl, guys, when I was look, when Essie sent me these pictures, I was like, girl, that's you. Look at her right there with that hat that looked like the Chinese hat. First of all, that's all hair. Because I know she's saying that's all hair. That's all hair. <laughs> 
head, no, though. No. People thought that clock was on the wall. That clock is on her hair. That people said saw that clock, that was on her head. That's me. Wait a minute. Look at her. Look, look at the hair on top. Essie did the hair. Look at how she look, girl. I'm telling you all the sassiness. So now when we see her today talking about the she do hair, she's a master cosmetologist. Stop playing with her. Y'all gonna put some respect on my girl's name. Y'all gonna put some respect on her name. Look at this. She is really talented. Now, I know I done heard her say she did hair shows and stuff, but I really had not seen the pictures and stuff of it. But when she sent it and I seen that she had orchestrated all of these things. Okay, wait a minute. Like, look at this. Look at her legs and stuff. Looking all sexy. You better work, ma. Look, I was looking at all of that. I was like, look at the thickness. And, and then even look at this. This just shows you that she molding the civil rights activist, boo. She's been molding that, boo. Anyway, okay, let, let, me, let, me, let me go back to Essie. Go ahead. Ah, I love you. I love you. I love you. You know, and this to me is a time... My story can maybe motivate somebody else. That picture right there, I was flown to Detroit, Michigan to do a show, um, do a girl birthday. She wanted me to do the people as African. That's when I found my mother in 2005, I think. I saw my mother for the first time 22 years later when y'all saw that dude. That dude right there, I won that too. That was a that white hat is hair, and that's a church on top of that hat. That was the one, the African birthday party. That's what I had on. You can't see my nipples there. Girl, don't look too hard. Girl, you better cover that up. You see my nipples in there? Ah, ah. Woo. Um, that's me in that blue. That's hair on top of my head. And those were all my models. Anybody who modeled for me, y'all might be see that chick over there to the blue. I mean, in the white blonde hair. That's my older sister to the white, to the right. That was her. That's me and my sister sitting in that chair. All those hats are hair. Come on, y'all. Y'all ain't trying to rock with me. You ain't trying to rock with me. That shirt is hair, Geneva. That boussier, that's hair. Okay, now and who is he? Who, who, who is he? Who is he? That's my cousin, Mark. He was a beautician in my shop. All those were my homegirls. That clock is on top of her head. That day on that particular hair show, some police stopped us and asked us what time it was. I was like, what, girl? We was gonna be late for the show. They escorted us to the show. That was on a military base, the one with the red hair. That guy y'all see right there, that was my second husband. That's my ex-second husband. That's two. That's braided hat, that comes off the head. That Everything you see is my work. Okay, okay, so the next thing that I wanna say is, okay, now let me take this down for a second because uh, there is because when i was going through the pictures i had seen this picture now let me see what this looked like on the screen okay i had seen this picture and it was this picture that i was looking at because you said this is your sister i was like is that michelle i was oh hell and Essie, you look like a little kid in this picture. And then now that you say that this is your second husband, I'm like, oh, okay. Girl, you look like a little baby. And then your sister, you know, because i never seen your sister, young, of course, before. So I was like, okay, wait a minute. So Michelle was in. Look, girl, so let me just talk and say this because when I unmute, then I can't say nothing else because I got to let you do your fact. So when I seen this, I was like, so what? Michelle was doing the hair shows and stuff with Essie. Okay, so not only that one. Wait a minute, I'm not done. Let me pop up this other one right quick so then Essie can say what she got to say. And then Essie said this was her sister. There she go on the end with the blonde hair. That is Essie's sister. And then there go Essie with the blue with the cowboy hat that she already said this is hair. And then I am very intrigued by this also because I'm like, okay, so it's one thing to go to cosmetology school and learn how to do hair. It's a whole other thing to be putting on hair shows and doing these huge productions and stuff so you're gonna have to give us you know lady some information right quick about all of this so go um well i don't know what information like like that particular show we did it to montel jordan this is how we do it 
that's what that show was. I remember because we had I helped made some of the clothes. I will so I could put a suit together in 24 hours sewing. You guys, I got a sewing machine, but I don't like to cut the pattern out. Um, every hair show that I have entered, I've never lost a hair show. Um, I just like fantasy. Everybody that you see, those were regular models. A master cosmetologist out of Georgia can do hair, toes, nails, facials. We're masters at what we do. So if you go to another state, the only thing you would have to do is reciprocity. I had my sister sometime, a couple of times working in shops with me. I think it was hereditary for both of us because she braids as well, but she didn't go to school for a cosmetologist, and I did. I just did that to hold a credential up under my belt. So if I decided I want to do anything else with hair, and these are just some of the ones that Geneva has saw. I got people with bird cages, trophy robots. I got I'm, I'm a beast at what I do, and the why I cover you up. That suit was made by me and my godmother um, that had all that hair. I just like different. I'm unique. I like something that's going to express. And if I go to a hair show, I don't want to see what I walk on the street to see. We see this on the street. You know what I'm saying? I want to see something that's going to be moving. I even got pictures with a young lady with a champagne fountain on top of her head. And it ran real champagne. Um, champagne. We did the glasses and everything. My photographer built me a battery pack and I was able to plug it in and the champagne was on top of her head and all of it was hair. I'm at the we met Geneva have to put one together, Geneva. What we wait for? She just keep throwing that picture up there with my damn legs. Girl, look, that's one of my best. <laughs> Cause I was like, she looks so cute on there. I was like, go girl, you better work. Okay, so was you doing hair when you was with your kids? father a uh, father or okay let me say this were you doing hair in your first marriage or no in your second marriage so what was your second husband he doing i mean like was he a model or something or what was he doing or just supporting you um i when my kids grandfather told me about me being cheated on and i need to do something that's when i became a cosmetologist so I was actually a cosmetologist with my first husband, but then for some reason, no disrespect to him because I love him to death. We're still friends, but it's about black men. When you get a, a career or you get something and you start doing your own thing, but you still include them, they feel like you think they're more than what they are. And we used to have that battle. So that was coming some of the reasons besides him being a cheater that we separated, but he's a good guy. Um, but we both were still young. My second husband, he was like a brick maser. Um, I think I was with him maybe eight, nine years. I'm not quite sure. Um, he didn't want to do those hair shows. I'm just telling you now. He didn't like the braids. But the girl, after I put them braids in homeboy hair, he thought he was a Casanova. Let's swing and get the women. He got too careless with that, my second husband, because I put him up. And he going to shows, people knowing him in shows. Now he think he's a Casanova. He want to hang out at titty bars and stuff. Oh, okay. Is that what we doing now? So with my second husband, why I separated for him, one, I'm already schooled by the first husband. Two, y'all already heard how I grew up. So three, you can't really put anything over on me. And one night we had just got through with a show. So he was going to go out a couple nights later. He don't tell me that two cops pulled him over the side of the road and gave him a DUI. Mm. I thought he was lying. What y'all brothers better realize, don't tell the lie when you get to the front of the door. Make sure you got your lie two steps back because we're going to have ours two weeks before we get to wherever y'all are talking about. The next morning, I called up the police station. I asked him about dude. He lied. So what I did, it was a Sunday. I go to church. I come back home. I told dude, I say, look, before I left, I said, we got to go up there and identify the cops who put you, did you, and disrespected you, violated your rights. He was lying. He couldn't do it. By the time I got home from church, he had all my shit packed on two trucks and he had moved me out of my house. That was the end of him. And that was the end of any hair shows that I did with him. But at the end of the day, I was pissed. He had all my shit, put it on two trucks, but I was laughing all the way because that was like, God, I need to get up out of here. But I'm a faithful wife. How do I walk? I didn't even have to walk. He couldn't cover his lie. And because he couldn't cover his lie, he put my stuff on two trucks. And we were in the middle of building a home. I, we had bought a place, but we were in the middle of building a home on an acre of land. And he did that shit and moved me out of my house.
And so after that, I didn't do no more hair shows with my second husband. I didn't want to deal with him. Um, he kept trying to get me back. It was a wrap for me, period. Later on, um, I divorced him. I left him with everything. I ain't materialistic. I don't have to have shit. I can walk away and redo what I do. I'm that queen in the game. But then he married a white woman. There you go. And my house was um, a huge house. Every room was like a 17 by 20 in the room, including the bathrooms, the closets, every room. They built it. My second husband had nine brothers, so it was a lot of them. And when they got through with it, we got divorced, whatever. Make a long story short, um, he got in some kind of trouble. The girl was trying to sell my house. My name was still on the deed. Dude came to me, said, Essie, would you please sign? She's going to try to take my house. Dude, I ain't got to sign shit because the house in my name. What you talking about? You wouldn't have got this girl. That's why y'all brothers mess up. It don't matter what color. I'm just saying in general, he happened to pick her and thought he was going to give her my house. And I left it with you when he signed it over to me. About six months, eight months, a year later, I don't know. Something came up. A judge from Georgia called me and said, yo, Assie, I'm going to put your husband in jail if you don't give him back the house and sign over. I told him I'm not doing shit and you ain't going to do shit from Alabama. I'm going to take my house. I sold it and I left his ass in jail because they tried to say he did fraud. So he took my house and four years later, I came back and sold it. That's the beast that I am and left him in jail. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Come on, it got to happen sometimes. It got to happen. So, wait a minute. What she said? I just said he had never had anything, my second husband. And when I started doing shows and women started noticing him, he got like your braids were hanging too long. Your hair was way up here, but the shit went down your back. Now you thought you was too cute. You want to sit up and swing in coochie bars? Okay, then just be truthful and say that. Don't bring your ass home lying because then you lost a good wife. And before we go any further for my next question, let me put it out here. However many times that we finna find out I've been married, there has never been a man that walked away from me. I've always divorced. Ain't nobody ever signed no divorce papers. I put them papers on that table. Point blank, period. All righty then. Basically, she said that, Miss Berry. That's how she... You know, that's how she feels on that one. And um, so did y'all have any children together? No. Children, no childrenos. So that means so far, Essie has been married. Now, where we're at in this story, she's been married a total of two times, two times. And she has two sons by the first husband, second husband. They were together eight, nine years, something like that. They ain't got no kids or whatnot. She was doing her man cheating, feeling herself a little bit, you know, because he was up in that mind and whatnot, whatever. Okay, so... um. So where did Fred come in at? You know, Fred every run Barry. So, you know, so how did you, you, you know, y'all meet? Come on now. Okay. Got, got, got to count. Got to count. I'm getting by Liz Taylor. Okay. So we don't wind up further. I done separated from him. He done moved me out my house. I'm living in my shop now. I had a beauty salon in a house. I reconverted the beauty salon, the front half, the beauty shop. I put my babies in the back with a TV, with a stove, with a refrigerator. I would go back there and cook. Hook them up, come back up and do hair. So by this time, I'm already doing my own thing with hair. Was I kicking it, dating a few people here and there? Just like, not me. I don't even say dating. I knew people, but I wouldn't sleep with anybody. I was cool with this one guy, and something came up that this broad walked up on me when I was trying to get sweet on him. That's what you don't want to do. You better have your broad in check. If you finna deal with me, you try to do some slide slick shit because I'll get your broad too and then I'm coming for you. And this dude, I just found him to be a liar. Next thing I know, I separated myself and here go reruns showing up in the mix. My girlfriend, Jamisa, called me. She said, yo, rerun finna be at the Civic Center, something like that. I said, what? I said, well, who are you to my rerun? She said, you know, Fred Barry from What's Happening? I said, okay. I said, what's happening? She said, I'm going to go up there. I said, okay, so call me, tell me how it went. She would not let me, she would not let me stop and not go up there. So I took a shower, got dressed and everything um, because he was in Columbus, Georgia to promote a movie about his life story. And the movie about his life story was called Testify, talking about how he became a locker, the dance group, you know, things he had went through with his mom. It was a beautiful story. And, and, and he got documents. 
before he passed away, a lot of the documents that he taught, I'm telling you about, he left them for me to tell his truth for him. So we went to the civic center where he was at and they were talking and then after everything was over he was telling people what he wanted to do because instead of somebody producing it for him he wanted to raise the money and produce it for himself because so many things had transpired so by this time she was like my girl was like go tell me you do hair i took my book up there i showed him i did hair and he was in awe that was it that was it all them women did but that was it and i don't know why he was attracted. I mean, just it was just different. I mean, after that night, I mean, he was stuck with me. Or I was stuck with him. I don't really know. So we went to there, and that's how we met as far as how we got connected. I didn't know if you want to ask me a question before I go further, or can I keep going? Keep going. Okay. Okay, so now I got him at the Civic Center. And we're traveling. We're doing things. I'm, I'm hooking him up with um, the Chamber of Commerce in Georgia, me, letting him meet people. And by this time, he's trying to raise money for his show. So I said, let's not, why not put a hair show together? So he's loving this idea. Girl, won't he do it? That's me, y'all. That's my stuff. I love the African. Um, that was one of the shows. So then when he saw my... Um, hair stuff. He was like, yeah. So we did eventually put a hair show on. But before then, before we could even get to that part and we started traveling, I didn't let Fred stay with me right off. I didn't. He stayed at a, oh, he stayed at a um, hotel. I think it was called Howard Johnson. Now, even though Fred, girl, is that me? Whoa, girl. Um, he stayed at Howard Johnson because we were going back and forth. So one day he getting ready to go out of town and y'all, he was a clown though. He, he had a good big personality by himself and dude turned around and ordered every damn thing on the menu and had it up in the room and didn't pay for it. He wasn't going to pay for it. So by this time he calling me telling me the police finna arrest him. I was like, what the hell are you talking about? I had to get dressed go to the hotel. Luckily, when I got there, the police were there and I knew the cops that were there. So I, I made it right with the tab and everything, but I had to make it right because he was, girl, you doing some serious picture shopping now. He had to, he was on his way to the Jenny Jones show. Um, this is going to air later, but there's actually footage of Fred um, proposing to me on the Jenny Jones show, but he's going to call me EJ because at that time when he met me, my name was Essie Jackson because I was still had my kid's father last name because they're Jacksons. And so I'm sitting at home and watching the Jenny Jones. We, we get ready to get married. And I saw him do that on a Jenny Jones. I could, I just couldn't believe it, you know? And after that, um, we did a hair show. Did we get married for the show? No, we did. We went and got married. We married on my birthday. We married on my birthday, October the 22nd, 1999. Okay. After we married, a little bit after that, I think in November is when we did the hair show, either November or December. Right after that hair show in 1999, after that hair show, we left and came to California. Wow. It, look. <laughs> okay, so he proposed to you on the Jenny Jones show. Because I remember you saying that. Because I, I would sure love to see that clip. I would love to see that. It's, it's on VHS. It's on a video. You know, like the VHS tape. So I got to take that and get it um, transferred to a CD. But how I got the video was after Fred died... I had told Jenny Jones and I called the casting and they sent me a complimentary video and I kept it all this time. Now I'm going to ask you some specific questions. So how old, how old were you two when you got married, you and Fred? I don't know, but I know we is 14 years apart. Oh my God, all this muting back and forth. And I got to remember. Um, 
because uh, right, because I remember that you were kind of young and he was a little bit older. So he was born in what year, and then died in what year? He was born fifty one, died in two thousand and three. I married him in ninety nine, and I was born in nineteen sixty nine. I ain't good with math, y'all tell me. And I think we had a fourteen year difference. I like older men. Period. Yeah. I think you were about 30 and he was 43, 44, something like that. Yeah. My other question for you is, did y'all have any children together? No, no. Um, somebody asked that on the question. So this will eliminate that question. Me and Fred Berry never had kids together, but his daughter, Portia, she came and I paid and sent for her because at one time Fred had this discrepancy between his children. Some people say he was like dead B. Some people say he wasn't taking his children, whatever the case may be. I had a relationship with his daughter. You got to realize for every kid, there's a parent, there's a mother and the mothers didn't like me. So I'm not going to simply play no games with somebody else ex because you don't like me. But I made sure that Fred had a relationship with all his children. I tried to anyway. Okay, so what about Fred did you like? Did you think he was fine when you seen him? You was like, oh my God, he's so sexy. I love his personality. He's funny. I mean, so what attracted you to him? Because I'm pretty sure a lot of people want to know that. Did you think he was fine and sexy? And what attracted you to him? <laughs> ah, she ain't got it. So the way she said, did you think he was fine and sexy? Listen. Y'all think he fine and sexy? I love his personality. He was a good guy. Um, let me see how Fred did this. Okay, so I had already been around him. I'm an outgoing person anyway. It was, I mean, I told you guys how we met. So we sitting on the porch one night. I'm just tripping because I had to go get him from the after he came back from the Jenny Jones because no hotel was going to deal with him anymore because of what he did with the food. We sitting on the porch one night. Homeboy said, listen. You ain't married. I ain't married. We both just out here single in the world. Hell, let's just get married and take it by storm. I'm looking at him like, what? Like, what? I'm like, what? He said, I'm for real. I said, what? He said, you ain't doing that. I ain't doing that. And he was like a big fish in Georgia in a little pond, you know, and I'm like, okay. And damn, y'all, I don't know. I just said, damn, yeah. I don't know why I just said, yeah. I really thought this dude was joking, but he wasn't joking. And when I seen the Jenny Jones thing, I knew he wasn't joking. So I really thought he was joking, and I married him. Hey. So how was the marriage? So what did you think about him when you married him? Okay. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Okay. Now. I never thought I would marry a celebrity at all. That's one. Never would I. No, I wasn't starstruck. It was like, damn, this dude was on TV and I knew him. I watched him. I was kind of like, wow, you know. But then I saw certain things about him. But then Fred was sickly and I had talked to his doctor one day and his doctor said his health has been better than it ever has been before since he's been with me. I was like, wow, is that because he's in the South and we giving him herbs and stuff or why is that? But then it seemed like Fred was a big fish in a little pond and it was like it was stuck for a minute because there was a lot of jealousy going on too. So... I, I don't let me let me see. I'm gonna say this in Georgia before I left Georgia. He was a he was a sweet guy, period. We were more friends, you know, than anything, and we became the like grew to more. But when we left Georgia, I sold everything I own, everything I own, and we did a hair show to get the money to come to California. I bought a convertible, we drove from Georgia to California. But it was when I got to California that I just seen different in him. I seen in the beginning it was okay because we had came back to California because HBO had talked to him about doing a deal about his life story. Something triggered him wrong. And we went to this meeting. 
Like he was telling me how to school me, what to do, how to do. I was like, okay, all right, we finna do this. But then when I got in the room and I was bubbling brown sugar, then he got mad because these these guys, they was Caucasian men, but they they were on me. We were talking. You said work the room. Okay, whatever. But they weren't like being negative, but I work what you said. And then he was upset about that. And then as we started living together, I saw more things about him. Like Hayward Nelson would ask me, like, how did you meet him? Do you really know who he was? And then I started seeing other things because he had a violent side to him too that I didn't know about. And people got to realize when you married to a celebrity, yeah, we're going to love them because we see them on TV, but there's some ruthless sides to celebrities. They have their own dark path that they went through. And sometimes it will reflect back on you. And sometimes I felt like that happened with me and Fred. Um, when he was good, he was good. When he was mad, he was mad. When he didn't like something, he didn't like it. Like I'm a normal person. I don't give a fuck how much money I get, what I get. We had a restaurant one day and we in the back of the line. When he had that beret on, people knew who he was. But when he got older, people quite didn't know if he didn't have a beret on unless you really look at him. So he stuck his beret on and all of a sudden, oh my God, we run, we run, we run, we run, we run. And then he wanted to go to the front of the line. And then he started talking crazy to me. That ain't what you're going to do to me. And so I got up on this, this big thing and I started talking smack because he was loud talking to me. I was like, is this what we doing? And so then the people came and got Fred. He said, I'm going on to the restaurant. I stayed in the back of the line. I don't think because you rerun and all these people been sitting here waiting to eat that we got the right to go before these people. That's the kind of shit he didn't like. That's the kind of stuff that celebrities did do. do. That's the kind of thing that I wasn't going to do. Um, she said, how it was when we was married? We went to a barbecue one day. I'm country. I, you know I know about barbecue. A lot of people, is there black, white, different races? But they was like taking the barbecue and not like eating with their hands. They had damn forks. I was like, what kind of mess is this? So I'm sitting back looking. I was like, okay, let me see how long these folks going to scuffle with them barbecue bones. Okay. So then I said, I need to go to the car. And I was looking cute. I went and got a t-shirt, a napkin, stuffed out in my shirt, right? And I went and got the barbecue. And I was like, I got pissed because he was trying to tell somebody how to eat, right? And these all these folks, y'all, they ain't even getting the meat because, like, you ain't holding the bone. So I go and I got ripped and got it all on my shirt. He was mad. I didn't give a damn. Don't sit up here and play like we finna be cute about eating some ribs. Y'all eat them ribs that way. I'm from the side, but I'm finna go and eat this, wipe my mouth, and go on to the next thing. So it's like certain places you go, you got to act a certain way. Or if you don't, you ain't in that circle. Like one night we went to a dinner. And there was a lot of people at the table. It was cool. But they got a thousand silverware. Everywhere you go, silverware, whatever. So I'm waiting, everybody talking. I'm like, okay, how long is it gonna take these folks to eat? What's the way y'all gonna do this long, this short one? I'm looking, and they still talking, and I'm hungry, you know. I just took that somewhere, move what I was gonna use, and I started grubbing. Fred got mad, but what you get mad for? I didn't even know what he got mad for. Other people did the same thing. We waiting to eat y'all talking. We gotta pick what silverware from the south. Y'all can play that if y'all want to. Go get 20 silverware and go eat that shit in the kitchen like that. Let's see what your grandmama going to do. Yeah, okay. So it was certain things that he was showing me, which I learned. But I just said, like, I'm not going to sit up here and be in the world and procrastinate because if you're famous or you're this, then I'm not going to be who I'm going to be. Um, he had funny ways about him, real charismatic, but he had ugly ways about him, you know, um, like, one, like one day, me and him had got into a controversy. I got pissed because I was tired of the bull crap. Believe it or not, it's happened. It's on the paperwork. But don't make this let you look at him anywhere differently. That would be your choice. I don't know what happened, but I felt like I didn't belong in California. I still feel like I don't belong because it's just like over. It's, it's, it's like overpopulated and it's just like it's overrated. So... I had told him I was going to go back to Georgia because I got tired. I just didn't want to play no more. Just It was just a lot of stuff going back and forth, me and him going back and forth. But he had good things about himself. Before I tell you about this bad thing, let me go back a little bit. 
there was like different things as characteristics that Fred would play because he was a comedian. And one day I heard this lady say, tamale, tamale. I've never had a tamale, never ate one. But when I got to California, I got my first tamale because Fred would like watch people outside and then he would sit in the house and he would become these people. And one day I heard this lady say, tamale, tamale. I said, hell, let me go get me a tamale. Let me go see. But it sounded like that lady was like right next in the next room. I get up to go get the tamale and it was Fred and a big ass sombrero, his little chest out. The things that you know what I'm saying, and he had an apron on, and he was like, Tamale, Tamale. That was the first time I ever ate a tamale, and I thought it was funny because I like being married to a comedian. Comedians can change their voices, they can sound like a lot of people. He became that tamale woman, and that was surprising to me. You got before I go? Wait a minute. So did y'all ever go out dancing, girl? Did you see him dancing? Was he getting it? What about the pop lockers? Did you meet the pop lockers? Come on, come on, right? We went out. Okay. <laughs> okay. One day we went out. He got a song. You know, I sent you the song. It was called I Got the Urge to Get My Groove On. But we went to this club when we had first met in Georgia. So we get to Georgia and we in this club. I forgot what club it was. Now they didn't know me and Rerun married. We didn't, we weren't even married time. We just going out. I'm showing the places. So I said, come on, let's go to this club. So at this time, we just kicking it around town. We pull up in the limousine and shit. We get out the club. I've seen him trying to make and Mac the club got his little, you know, thing on, his beret. And these two bras, young chicks. Oh, that's my yeah, that's an old brother. You know he old. That's Rerun. He can't do that. And I said, is that right? I said, Fred, come here. I said, these bras over here trying to like slay you and say you ain't the same Mac. You can't do that. He said, really? So he went and put that song on. I got the urge to get my groove on. That song, Geneva. And, and so the song started playing, right? And these girls are talking shit. Fred came over. He was like, like he was challenged. Like, come on, come on. Dude got on that flow. Dude got on that flow. Play a lock it down. Them girls came in like this, like, Y'all, y'all ain't tired, is you? Y'all ain't tired. And then later on, they saw me with Fred, so they knew I heard what they said, and they knew I had told Fred. And we was jamming the rest of the night on the floor. So, and but you know what? I ain't trying to be funny. I can dance, but this brother, like, he go a whole nother level with it. Doing the splits and all his stuff, not slow mocha. He just he carried the floor. He carried the floor. Even though he got a partner, he don't give a damn. He's going to carry that flow. Y'all seen him? He was like that in real life. No problem. He was like that. He was. So did you ever meet the lockers? I met Don. I met Don Jr. Um, I met Slim, the robot. Um, Shabadoo, I think y'all remember Shab Girl Shabadoo, do y'all know Shabadoo. Um, very, 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 very good guy, very sexy guy, sweet as hell, and smells so good. I'm just saying, smells so good. Um, I got to meet them all. I heard some of their stories, a lot of the stories I heard from Fred. Um, there was another locker. I get, think y'all met the white girl, uh, Tony Basil. Hey, Mickey, you so fine. I met all of them pretty much, the ones that were still alive and still living. Yeah. Um. So was Fred broke and on drugs when you met him? Damn, she just cut to the throat. Like, ah, 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 was he broke? Yes, he was broke. Yes, he was broke. I, I have to be honest with you. When I met Fred, he came to Georgia with a hundred dollars in his pocket and a plane ticket. Everything that was given to him was given to him on credit. Cause you know what I'm saying? They do that because they do that because you're a celebrity. That's why he had to end up coming to stay with me after that happened. I found no disrespect. I found richer things and richer like money. He was more richer alive. I mean, richer dead than he was when he was alive because so many things had transpired through his career. But he knew I was a master cosmetologist, so I was still making money. I had two salons and I had one at my house. 
Okay, so what did he say happened to his career? He got drugged up. Um, the first, he was a millionaire twice. This is what he told me, and this is some paperwork. But he said the first time, you know, he wasn't used to it. He a heavy set dude. People always like um, making fun of him. When he got money, he got fame. He could buy pretty much any woman he want. They didn't care what he looked like, what size. So basically, they wanted him for his fame and who he was. Um, with him like doing drugs at that time, because he never did drugs with me. Um, two times he said he did that. The first time, I think someone with his, his wife, Francesca, me and her are pretty cool. I um, haven't heard from a minute, but I could call her and she would pick up the phone. Um, she was a professor. Y'all might have seen her on one of the What's Happening thing, um, shows because she was a dancer with him. I think through the years, um, so much hardship came upon Fred that he used drugs to get rid of some of his emotional baggage. Like to be that young, they all were teenagers, to be that young and have that type of fame and fortune at time, you know, it'll swallow you up. And I saw that, I saw what it almost did to me, just like being in Hollywood or around people. So I could imagine if you are a millionaire and you gotta have this, per se image. You got to always look a certain way. You always got to be a certain way. You can't be yourself anymore because everyone knows your face. And when he lost that um, twice, I mean, like one time he told me the first time it was um, a loan shark and he had gave away so much money that the loan shark came and collected and they sent his ass packing I think they took the house, the car and everything. I think they say he walked away with just what a scooter or like a horse or something like that. And he just walked away. I mean, they took his stuff because he was too busy, like doing drugs. And that made a conflict with him being a father and a husband as well. Okay. So what did he, did he ever say anything about the, um, his cast members on what's happening? Cause yes, he was on soul train too. Yes. We definitely seen him dancing on soul train, but, um, what's happening. What, what did he say about his cast members? You know, cause you told me some stories about the cast members that I found to be really, cause I don't know about y'all. If y'all seen, um, what's happening on unsung. Cause I did see that. I did see what's happening on unsung cause I'm a huge what's happening fan. And as a matter of fact, I was trying to figure out why they didn't do an unsung of just Fred rerun Barry period, but come to find out, you know, you probably couldn't miss Barry cause they probably scared of miss Barry. That's probably why they ain't tried to do one of him on. But anyway, if y'all seen that, they only gave a little bit of the information in comparison to the information that Essie have and what she said Fred told her about some of the cast members, how they passed away and blah, 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 blah. Essie going to tell you. Okay, go ahead, Essie. Okay. Unless it's a lie and somebody going to come review it, then let me hear the lie because you can't take back what Fred told me. Mabel King. Mabel King. Mabel King was the mother. Mabel King was supposed to have asked for a home in Hollywood at that time when she was on the show. When you guys saw her got rolled off the show, she just asked for a house. Somebody said that, well, Fred said that they didn't give her her house. Um, they wrote her out the show. Several years later, she ended up in a nursing home. Um, one of her legs got amputated. Somebody came in the Kyle Leslie home, checked Mabel King out the Leslie check Miss Mabel King out of the convalescent home. Two weeks later, they found her dead. Unless somebody knows something different, then you let me know, but that's what I was told. Shirley, Shirley died November 99. Me and Fred was together. Um, he took that really hard. He took that really, really hard because uh, him and Shirley was close and he would communicate with her a lot. I, I don't want to tell her personal business, but at the end, Shirley was sick because I know y'all saw how her face changed. Um, Hayward, he was a good guy. I think I had some pictures with Hayward. Uh, we went on a, through a few um, functions together, well, one or two. Um, was Ernie there? I'm not quite sure. I don't think Ernest was there. He may have been, but we didn't cross paths like that. Um, what people don't know, back in the day when What's Happening was airing, all these people that are black people from what's happening, 
from Good Times, from the Jeffersons, a black man named Eric Monty and Cooley High. He wrote all those. Okay. Fred was supposed to be a white skinny boy, and he showed up for the casting of what's happening. Two weeks later, at the casting, they called him back, and he became rerun. They gave him a name. He gave them a character. But in back in the 70s, black actors were making $5,000 an episode, where white actors were making $8,000 an episode. After the first two castings and they went on and they saw what was happening was going to be a big, huge success. Like, I'm not taking any credit from any of the cast, but we know what the deal was. It was rerun. It was Shirley and it was D. But all of them kind of blended together like T. And they didn't want to give it to him. But Fred, now, please don't nobody come back and get nobody on this mic to come and come test this because we're going to be battling. But Fred took all the cast members. All of them went and asked for more money. By the time Fred asked for more money, he looked like he was crazy. He looked like he was being um, like 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 he was being like what, what like a problem, as I would say, because he was asking more. When they went, everybody agreed. Yeah, we're gonna get paid the same thing. When he got there, everybody shut up. He the only one stood up, and then that's why after that. They wrote him out and it went to what's happening too, because there was other things that they, what's happening now. There was other things that in this in court document is not what I say is what I can prove, but there were other things that they had promised him because they had went into syndication. But then when it went into syndication, it didn't go quite like he wanted. And I'm not going to lie too. I probably think that Fred may have been a little bit of problem because some of the documents I read, some of the things I seen, he is very, very outspoken. He didn't care. He was bold with what he say. If he didn't like something, he would say it. So that's just who he was. So I think like a lot of people try to say he was a hothead. No, he was just trying to make a difference for all the people that was on what's happening. He wanted more money and everybody was scared to ask for more money. Wow. So I think my next question is... Uh... How did he pass away? Okay, that's how we gonna roll. I don't, I don't, I, I, one hundred percent. I can't say one hundred percent. This is what I do know, because I'm gonna have to back y'all up a little bit to know how we got here. Even though me and Fred was together, and he had good things about him. You may not believe it. It is on a police report, but it happened. So we'd be like, oh my God. Okay. So one day I told Fred that I want to leave and I want to go back. Why well, I told him I want to go back to Georgia because he had brought me out to California. I felt like it was coming from the dogs to the wolves, period. I felt like everybody had a, a personal motive. Everybody wanted something. They wanted something out of you. I didn't like it. I didn't because I was too straightforward for a lot of these people out here. And they felt like I had an attitude. No, I'm just direct and I'm not going to hear that bullet crap. So I don't know what happened. All I know is he was like, okay. Next thing I know, I go back to the room and go outside. Fred to put his damn beret on his head. He took a hammer, put it in his back pocket, walked down some stairs. So we had a little penthouse, real nice place. And he started breaking my damn windows out of my convertible. He broke all my headlights. He broke my windows. He broke all my damn windows out of my car so I couldn't leave. That's how bad he didn't want me to leave. And why I was going to leave is because Fred was married six times. Two of the women he married twice. These other women have brutal stories, too. I didn't even know he was an abusive person. So this old lady that was from the South, she said, Essie, I want you to come hear something. Where we were at, they had this garage, and he would sell old antiques. She made me hide behind this stand. When I hid behind that stand, I heard a dude say he brought me out to California to pimp me, and I was a moneymaker. Wait, 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 wait. Now, who said that? Are you saying Fred said that he brought you out there to pimp you and to be his moneymaker? Now, you know, as big as my damn mouth is, I'm sitting behind there listening to him tell that old man that 
It took everything in me not to jump up and go just jack his ass. So that's when I told him I was leaving. And that's when he took his butt outside and broke all my windows out of my car. He didn't even know why I told him that. He didn't even know I had heard it. But by the time he did that, I was already down the stairs with a baseball bat. The police came. Eight guys picked me up. And I was finna get I, I was to get Fred. I'm straight telling you, you want to play that shit? Okay. Cause we out here in Cali. Cause what it is, y'all, what I didn't know, like he could go tell my whole car because it was a state of California and they was community property. They said, Oh shit, we can't do it by that. He can go break it again. I was like, damn. Okay. So now what I'm gonna do? You know, took me from my hometown. You brought me out here because you saw I was a money maker. You said you loved me. I thought you loved me. Maybe you didn't. It was a biz deal. I didn't know. But when I heard that, everything in me changed. I didn't even look at him the same no more. But then when I had heard from the other wives, then I know why. One of his wives, he he broke her hand with a hammer. One of his wives, he beat her with a baseball bat and a concussion. It ain't what I say. It's what I can prove. But that's those stories. That's their stories to tell. It's not mine. And so when we was getting ready to do the show, those are things that was going to be on the show. So people would hear what we as women go through when we're married to celebrities. I had never went through nothing like that before. And what happened was he got mad that I told him I wanted to leave. And Fred walked up to me, looked me dead in my eyes and said, you know what? I dream I shot your chest out with a double bear shotgun in your sleep. I was like, damn, what? I gave him a kiss on his jaw. Okay, baby. And I walked off. I walked off. I think Fred was angry because he said every time he was with someone, they would always leave. No, it wasn't that they would always leave. You had situations and issues. What'd you say, Geneva? I'm over here like that sound like Ike and stuff when you said when when you said that he said that women always leave him. I'm like, that sounds a little bit like a Ike. And then I'm sitting up here thinking, what in the world made him feel like that he could pimp you? I mean, so is this something had he pimped his other wives? Did he have a reputation for pimping women? Like, what made him feel like he could bring you out there and pimp you? And then was it something with you doing your hair shows that he was like, well, she get money. So, I, I, I mean, like, girl, what, what the hell? So, he had been married six times. I was the last wife. Two of the wives he married twice. I don't know about their talent, but if you go back, and y'all look at what's happening. You see this chick with a, a dance. She was in a club dancing. That was Rerun's first wife. Um, the second wife, she was a nurse or something. I don't, I'm not sure what Carol was. The third wife was a nurse. Um, but from what they told me, every woman that Steve, I mean, damn Steve, fucking um, every wife, see all these cheaters getting mixed up. Every woman that Fred would marry, he would marry them. Then he would go back to the state where he where he married them and then that's where he would divorce them and go take their stuff two of the wives they say he tried that he couldn't do that with me um so it won't come out later somebody saying something when me and fred got out because he was about money but i realized that then so that pimp stuff that he said made sense later first you got to look at how i was doing hair you saw my work so you know i was talented as i don't know what Second, I made we made over forty thousand dollars in one night off of one hair show, and that was all mine. Third, he saw I was a money maker, and that's what Hollywood was about. They was about different. They was about unique. I had all those things in the one. I was unique. I was different. I was nice looking. I was country. They, it's like it's some different about us southern folks that they love about us. So he saw that money making thing about me. He said I had that it factor, whatever the fuck the it factor was. But he didn't know that the it factor. I was real about who I am. So we get out here to California. And I don't know how this came about, but he went on. Now I'm married to dude. I'm married to dude. He wanted to go on a show called Who Wants to Date a Celebrity? Hmm. Hmm. He filmed it. He did everything. And then they found out that he had a wife. He had to go down to the courthouse and put papers like me and him was going to get divorced or they weren't going to pay him and let him do the show. 
So he wanted me to go on with it and 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 act like I didn't care. But that pissed me off. And then I just look at him differently because now I'm saying that you'll just do anything for money. Because if you got a wife, why would you go do that? And it, and it was no connection. And it's called Who Wants to Date a Celebrity? You probably can find the video on. So I'm just saying. And he never served me the divorce papers. See, that was another thing. He never served me anything. But because he wanted to go do this show, that's why he did that. And then he got the money. And then let everything else go. Okay, so you two weren't, so you two were still married when he passed away. Okay, so were you, so were you two living together when he passed away? How did you find out that he passed away? What exactly happened? Because I know that he passed away on your birthday, right? Okay, so go ahead. One day, one day before my birthday, the 21st. Okay, so we had got into a confrontation because Fred did his thing, I did mine. He wanted me to travel with him because he had came with Cosmo deals. I had children. I couldn't pick my shit up and be a single mom. He wanted me to send my son off to Mary Maryland. Dude, I didn't leave my son in Mary Maryland, so we got into a confrontation about that. So he started traveling for a minute. I stayed in my position. We kind of separated to a degree. He went on about it, but we stayed married. At any time, he could have served me. I, it was what it was. Um, three days before he came to California because he was out of town, he called me and he apologized for hurting me, for disrespecting me. But he said that he had never dealt with anybody like me. And he just got nervous because of everything that transpired. So I was like, okay, whatever. I said, I tell you what, when you get to town, we'll talk about it. That was on October the 18th, maybe the 19th. October the 21st, I was at home getting ready for him to come in. I was supposed to be the one pick him up at the airport, but some he had came in early and I didn't know it. So when he had called me, he was already in California. So I'm getting ready to do whatever. And all of a sudden breaking news came on and it said he was had passed away. I said, what? I found out he died on TV like everybody else. Um, when I saw it on TV, I thought it was a joke. I mean, I thought, like, does this cat playing with me? Just see how I'm gonna react. It wasn't a joke. I called his friend. I wanted to find out what happened. Come to find out, Fred came back in early. He went to a friend's house. Everything that went on with his death, I didn't find out anything to 2013 because it was so much going on. People were coming at me from everywhere, wanting me to sign deals, do that. I just couldn't do it. I had never experienced nothing like this before in my life. And then to know that in an instance, I was a widow of a celebrity. And here I am a country girl from Georgia. What the hell was I supposed to do? I was married in 99. That was only three years difference. And here I am with all this big plate of stuff on my lap and married to one of the most famous men in the 1970 what was i supposed to do so after i found out so many things went on um they took fred body somewhere because for whatever reason people i guess they felt like i didn't have a right or i wasn't married to him it don't matter what we went through i was his fucking widow i married him i got my papers to prove that whatever the the kids and one of his friends they had started doing the funeral so now I know Fred passed away and I'm sitting up here about three days until I pass away. All I'm just, I'm just like devastated. I'm still crying. I'm still thinking about the last words he said to me. I'm looking at him on TV. I didn't know what to think. And then like four or five days, three days, baby four to pass and I ain't heard shit. So I called a girl from mine who's a paralegal. I couldn't think. Come to find out they had Fred body somewhere, way past somewhere. I was in Inglewood at the time. When they called, I said, hello, this is Fred Berry's widow, wife. They said, widow, wife? No one told us that. Is that right? So by that time, everything changed. Everything changed. They found out I was a widow. I had to prove that. Um, I had his body in a, uh, a church called um, Simpson Mortuary. It was in Inglewood, California. It was a preacher there who knew Fred. Um, they knew that Fred had been there before. He had shown me pictures, told me things. And I believe this guy, 
Um, people were coming in to view his body after I got him to Inglewood. If it hadn't been left to me, I would have buried him in Inglewood. I wouldn't have buried him where he is now. Um, the, it was they had they had ordered like limousines. Some people didn't even ride in the limousines. They was angry. It was just it was just so much chaos. Like because when a person dies, everybody want to know what they're gonna get, who in charge, what's going on, and then you talking to me crazy. And then see, I had to come out the box on certain people. So they had seen other sides of me and certain people that came and Fred Circle celebrities. Even I had never seen some of these people before, so it was all new to me. And after they shipped his body to Simpson Mortuary, everybody had visited him. I just let everybody did their thing. And I went in there by myself and I just sat. And I just don't know, like even with his death, he didn't look right. He didn't look right. His, his neck was swollen. And I kept saying that. And after I got him buried and we had put him in the ground, Maybe three days after that, four days after that, I got a phone call from a female. And the house that they found Fred at, deceased. She called and told me that they were doing heavy drugs. That's what I was told. And Fred slipped and hit his head. And they put him back in a, back in a bed dead. And because he was staying at a friend's house and that girl said that he slipped and hit his head. They were doing drugs and they put Fred back in the, back in the bed dead. I kind of believe that because on his autopsies in 2013, after those years later, I seen ligature marks around his legs and this like somebody could have done that. But I always thought about his neck. I thought the girl was playing or I thought it was one of the X member. I mean, an ex one is ex-girlfriend. I didn't know ex-wife. I don't know why was somebody calling tell me that. So winding up for 2013, we get ready to do the reality show. Something came up with Fred's um, daughter, Portia. So I asked for the autopsy. When I get the autopsy, it didn't make sense. None of it made sense. Um, it's... Okay, so let me just go. The dude was saying, Fred was at the house with the dude. The dude said he Fred fed Fred the day before. So Fred ate the day before. That was on the 19th to 20th. He didn't see Fred no more. He said Fred went in the wrong room to go to sleep. Mind you, he had called me and told me he's coming to town. He was already in town, but he was at this guy's house. Okay, so he at the guy's house. They done ate and everything. I done seen this on TV, but then the police report in the autopsy it said that the dude that was in the house knocked on the door where Fred was sleeping, didn't get no answer, got scared. How the hell are you scared in your own house? But okay, we're going to play this. And then called Fred's best friend, which lets, which lived almost 35 to 45 minutes away. You ain't going to call the ambulance. You ain't going to call the police. But you going to call his best friend. So then his best friend get to the house where Fred died at. And they get in the car. This all in the autopsy. I'm finding this out of 2013. It's 22,003. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. That's 10 years later. I'm finding this out. Because I, I was just, it was just so much going on through the years. They get in the car, they go get the fire station to come back and pronounce Fred dead. That don't make no sense to me. I said, why y'all ain't caught the police? They said that the police. 911 went working. I checked all that shit out. That was a lot later on. But Portia, his daughter, they called Portia. They called Portia on the 21st at four o'clock in the morning, which would have been four o'clock California time, but seven o'clock Georgia. 21st. They didn't pronounce Fred body dead to that night on and on the 21st at 9 o'clock p.m. Fuck was y'all doing this body all that time? What was it? What happened? How did this happen? It made me believe everything. And in the police report, in the autopsy, that said in that autopsy, 
A woman called the police station, just like I'm talking to y'all. Hello, I want to tell you that Mr. Barry was taking drugs to someone. Um, he fell and his hip hit his head and they put him back in the bed dead. That was in the police report. So that means black folks ain't gonna just call the police for no reason. So that woman exists to this day. That's why I said he something else happened. That's why I said it was something shady. And there was a $20 million cover up in between that. All that was going to be exposed on that reality show in 2013. I never got to that. That was the only way that I was going to bring everybody out of the closet. I had did my whole thorough investigation. But then when I saw this and I started pulling the paperwork from back when I found out about the cover up, everything started making sense. But if you go back and look at the police report, L.A. Los Angeles should be up on investigation. The whole damn police report, how they came and got him. What was y'all doing with his body for 24 hours? Why did you call Portia for? See, now I'm putting all this out here now. So now y'all know the fuck I know. Because I had never told nobody that I did all the research to know this. So now I know that you did something, Shiesty, because of the simple fact, the police report, the lady called me. You called Portia at 4 o'clock. They found out Fred was dead at 9. Well, that's when I saw that it on TV that he was passed away and deceased 9 o'clock that night. But she had called Portia that morning. So I'm saying at 4 o'clock that morning, 21st to 9 o'clock that night, what was his friend doing? What was Skip doing? What was the brother doing? What was the son doing with his body? But y'all went through a lot of the shit. I know that. They went through a lot of his paperwork and stuff. So it was a lot of other stuff. But also, when they did the police report, People saw articles where Essie said she wanted to dig up rerun. Yeah, I said that. Why? Because we were getting ready to do a reality show. I could go get some homies and come back and let them dig up his body. Because now what I know for sure is that the person who did the autopsy, you didn't do a credible autopsy because Fred took insulin. They said there was no medication in his system. How is that? And he had high blood pressure and he had insulin. And you're going to tell me when nothing in his system? Red flag. And then let me bring this up too, because when you look at articles that came out at that time, like this is an article dated October 22nd, 2003, that said Barry died Tuesday at his home in Los Angeles, apparently of natural causes. Officer, police officer Jason Lee said the county coroner was investigating, but friends said Barry had been ill because of a recent stroke. So, what do you have to say about this stroke? in june but we were still separated but he went out of town when somebody told him not to so i'm still saying you should chill out he go out of town me and him kind of separated at that time but i did find out later about it but he don't listen so even though he went in and he had the stroke he had to go to some kind of function they were paying him for whatever and he didn't stay in the hospital and he just left when the doctor told him to stay and just got out you know what i'm saying he was on a crutch and a a walker you see what I'm saying? But at the same time, Fred was going to do what he had to do. And I still just couldn't pick up and leave. But at that time, I didn't know. By the time I did, he had already left the hospital. So he was sickly. He was sickly for a good bit as well. Some people say he died of heart um, complication. That's what you say. Okay. But if I was going to pull his body back up and I look what's on that autopsy, I, I would I would maybe like challenge that because of the, how the autopsy did, how it didn't make sense. Just, it just it got to make sense when somebody died. It didn't make sense. And then come to find out um, there was some bank accounts later on that I found about and there was probably 20 million dollars. It ain't what I say. BB&T Bank is what I can prove. And I talked to this this lady. Her name was Jackie Peevely. So I'm going through all Fred paperwork because I got the suitcases with a lot of his documents from this house and it was a car there so i called this lady trying to find out you know still working trying to find about his business and girlfriends say um who are you i said i'm fred's widow i said i just need certain paperwork can you help me before i even could get it out of my mouth good she said you know what you're not gonna say shit. you're not gonna see shit. there was a lot a lot a lot a lot of money in his bank accounts and now he's dead and everybody's asked me about the bank accounts i had a heart attack over his bank accounts really that's when all shit changed and i flew to maryland 
and I flew to Maryland in 2005 because after she told me that and I asked for the records, they took a whole year and I couldn't get the records. By the time I get to the bank, I'm wa walking up, supposed to speak to her supervisor, this lady from the bank where the $20 million was at. Her name was Kim Ray. I get the bank and ask for Kim Ray. They said, Kim Ray ain't here. I said, well, I came away from Georgia, no California. So I'll wait for Kim Ray to get here. They saw I wasn't going anywhere. Next thing I see, a white boy walk around the corner, short, bald looking dude. His name was Kim Ray. He was the vice president of the bank. I told him about what I found out. And then he told me the paperwork I would have to get. He said, it'll take you seven days. I said, that ain't what God said. I'm going to get the paperwork tomorrow and I'll be back. By the time I got to the bank to confront about anything else, he had quit the bank. The vice president did. So that was another cover up. And there was a, and I got like I have a time, I sent you that timeline and I researched everything and did the investigation myself. But when all this shit came up with Steve Harvey, the reality show, what I'm telling you about now, this is what my show was going to be about. Because I was going to find out what really happened and I was going to put it all on blast and do it. You see what I'm saying? That way nobody couldn't cover nothing up because they weren't used to direct people like me. And it was one lady who covered a lot of the stuff because how they started, it was with a nonprofit organization that had been forfeited. They revised the nonprofit organization, run the $20 million through there. Fred went on a show called Weakest Link. He needed an organization to put his money in. A lot of times when you see these celebrities with these nonprofit organizations, the profit is going to them. Some of it may go to the company. Only what, 25%? The other 75% go to the person who opens or owns the nonprofit organization. And that's how they was able to fund the money through. I got the 990s and all that. If anybody was to challenge this video, then they would have a problem. Because BB&T, Jackie Peavy, Kim Ray, all of them should be up under investigation right now. So while I was sitting over here having a merry day being accused of being a co-conspirator and extortionist, this is what pissed me off because they had already did this to my husband and not adding to insults to injury. Some broad telling me that my husband was killed and they put him back in the bed dead because he slipped and hit his head. Why did he call the ambulance? So wouldn't that upset you too? Because now... Yeah. I individual because now I can't even do this to find out what happened with my husband because I had tried to do the show and I got all this other stuff so it was like everything that went on with my husband's death everything I found out it was just washed away yep it totally makes sense it it uh okay so what is this document right here because it's a document that I was going to put up what is this document right here. Can you explain to us what this is? Wait a minute. I gotta Read that document. damn letter. That's where the cover up started. Now, if you're not gonna, if this is not true and this is not factual, why would you take enough time to alter a letter of this magnitude if there was no cover up, if there was no money? Can you read that letter, Geneva? It's Okay, let me read it. I got it in front of me. And it says, to the best of my what I can see, it says, M2G Funding Group has a source of funding available to your company for any loss amount in excess of $5 million. The rate as of today, June 6th, is 2.8%. Mind you, this is dated for June 6, 2003. So at this time, Fred Berry is still alive. It says, to start the process, we at M2G Funding Group needs a letter of interest from your bank. The process takes three to four weeks for funding. Please see the sample letter below. And since it says, since the letter from the bank is received and the consultant fee is signed, it will be something into underwriting and the lender will contact you already. But yeah, it's definitely marked out. It's scratched out and everything else. I don't know what is the whole scratch out thing about. Do y'all see this letter? Can y'all wait, wait a minute. Let me try to put this. Wait, where the hell is she at? Okay. <laughs> where she go I'm, I'm too busy reading the letter i didn't even know she had left okay i'm i'm, I'm, I'm gonna put her mic back on 
Okay, so that letter that you see was the beginning of the cover up for BBNT Bank. That person, Jackie, Jackie, her last name is Peebly. There was supposed to be five million dollars of Fred money in an account. There was eight accounts in one bank, but different locations. I don't know too many people, unless you are a millionaire, that you got fucking eight bank accounts in one. Me and Portia called one day on the phone. We heard the BBT representatives got the recording of the tape say that poor, poor lady, they robbed her husband bank accounts, not knowing that they took supposed to be $5 million against his receivables to put that $20 million letter up there that you got. That's the next letter to that one. So they did this to write the letter out. Then that second letter that you finished showed you need if you got it, where it shows the $20 million went in. Being real, I really felt like that's why Fred had a heart attack. Think about the time he had the heart attack in June. He got happy because he knew that damn money he had went through. I'm just saying. You there? Look, that's why I said y'all got to give me a minute. I'm back here pressing like two, two, two million buttons. Like y'all don't even see it. I'm over here. Click, click, click. And then... Me and Essie had a conversation before here. I'm trying to figure out what documents to put up. And, the, and then Essie says, yeah, that document that Geneva about to put up. I'm like, shit, I ain't even got the document. So, so now I'm trying to go to my email, get the document. But I know she's saying something, but I can't hear her right now. Right? She's saying something, but I'm just trying to take the document and send it to myself. Okay, I just sent it to myself. Okay, now what she I'm sorry about that, Geneva. I just know when you showed that letter... That was the dummy letter to that $20 million cover up. It should have been that letter. Then you're going to read that next letter that says the 20 million went through his, his cover up. If you want to, if you got it. Can y'all hear me? Yeah, well, I know y'all couldn't hear me because I'm talking to myself while I'm over here looking up the trying to pull this document. So go ahead and say whatever you want to say, Essie, while I pull up this document about the cover up. OK, so you you guys are not going to understand this right now because this had that had been almost a nine year investigation before I had got to where I was on in 2013 when we were getting ready to shoot the reality show. A lot of what you're finding out right now is for the first time ever have even been told, even including about Fred's death. There will be other, um, we're going we're gonna to do our own little thing. We, we'll talk about it later, but you will be able to see the autopsy for yourself. You'll be able to see the paperwork for yourself. I can even show you the bank accounts. I can show you the whole procedure. But I knew when that woman said, um, not that one, it's another one. I knew when that woman said that, who the fuck did I think I am? I wasn't going to see shit. There was a lot, a lot of money. There should be no bank teller that was talking to me of that magnitude like that. And that was a problem to me. And a little bit after that, Fred has two brothers and a sister, I think. His, one of his brothers was attached to that account and went up in that bank trying to get the money out. And he had a heart attack, they say. They say his brother had one. I think his youngest brother, Ricky, died. Maybe like a couple of months after Fred died because they were very close. And at this time, even if you guys were to see it, whether Geneva find it or not, it just, I just like, I don't like to put, say something if I can't prove it. So there's a letter to show that as well. That's why I said, like, did, did somebody knock him off? Why did y'all have his body that long? Where was his body from four o'clock to nine o'clock that night? Why did you feel like you had to get in a car with his best friend and go get um, that one? That's the one. Read that, Geneva. Can't hear you. Yeah, I, I know y'all couldn't hear me. I was trying to pull us, still trying to do this document. Oh my God, interviews is just like, oh, I gotta pull documents, move stuff to the side, and da 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 da. Could be a lot of work over here. Okay, now let me read this document. It says dated June 25th, 2003, to Dana Smith. This is Heffman Insurance Agency. It says at the request of Suitland. Best RSPA, we are pleased to inform you that the company has been a most valued 
customer of our bank since 1999. The Sweetland Fest RSPA has conducted their affairs with us in a very satisfactory manner. At a personal level, we feel Fred Berry is of good moral character and that he would comply dutifully with any financial obligation incurred with your institution. Suitland Agency has requested our office issue a direct payment letter of credit against his receivables of $20 million United States dollars. This Wait a minute, let me reread that again. Suitland Agency has requested our office issue a direct payment slash letter of credit against his receivables of 20 million United States dollars. This letter is to inform you that the bank will underwrite the direct payment letter of credit subsequent to further due diligence and underwriting of the project and the principles. Please do not hesitate to contact us. If we can be of further assistance, I can be reached at the blah, 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 blah. Now let's see what Miss Mary have to say about, what the hell? What is this? I, okay, now we see why she investigating and want to dig up bodies. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Let's see what... Um, I rest my case. So why did you think that I dragged this dude for all these years? He want to play a damn game. I had my reality show. This shit was going to come out on the show. Y'all heard it for y'all I didn't have nothing but time. I was going to take the bank down that everybody, until that shit happened in 2013, it was going to be a wrap, Geneva. So now, if you guys want to, go Google my husband's net worth and see what it's really about. See what it's really worth. I'm just saying. And it still, and that's why that girl told me I wasn't going to see shit. That's why she said it was a lot, a lot of money. That's why she said she had a heart attack over the bank account. How you going to have a heart attack with somebody else's husband's bank account? Mm -hmm. Now you see. So what was it? Why, why, why did this happen? Nothing. If you, and if you read the autopsy, which we'll get into that later, because we're going to do a document about it. But you will see that it is nothing makes sense in it. It looks like a straight cover up and BBNT Bank. I would never trust BBNT Bank, not for the rest of my life. Y'all can go get the damn person, Mr. BBNT himself. Tell him to give him this video because I will come for him too. Because they are liars. They did this. They covered it up. And then when he died, they funneled his money through a nonprofit organization. You heard it for yourself. Sula Fest Community Development Corporation was a non forfeited company in 1997. They turned around and redid the company and brought it back up to standards in 2001 when Fred Berry went on Weakest Link. So RSPA was called Rerun School of Performing Arts. That's what RSPA was for. And he was actually Sula Fest. When you, get a, when you get a company, you have to ask for a... Uh, um, a EIN number for any company. So I knew someone who worked. I, I After he died, I wanted to see who initially registered for that Suitland Fest RSPSA company and who asked for that EIN number. It was done in my husband's name. So the bank turned around with this chick and other people, Kim Ray, the manager of the bank in Washington, because I flew to Washington, they snatched the damn money. And then did you knock him off? I don't really know. Because why did they hold his body so long? And if you pay the right person, your kid folks will get you to. It had to make sense to me. And none of it made sense. And when I found out about it, I called this one council member out. She wanted to say, oh, Essie, that's not true. How about if I send you one of my FBI partners? Yeah, okay. So your FBI partner can, what, do something to me? Because I know damn well that you're not going to help me because you are part of the cover-up in the crime. Where the $20 million at? Yeah, wait a minute. Yeah, what where where is the 20 million? So you said that the rerun, oh my like I didn't even know that. Okay, now first of all, let me just say this right quick. I forgot I got mascara. See, that's why I do not like wearing makeup because I forget I got it on. I start rubbing stuff. First of all, let me say this right quick. The Essie 
has hands down, hands down, one of the best memories that I re that uh, uh, that I have of a person that I have ever met. Period, hands down. A lot of the things that she is telling you, I have heard tenfold over, and she always says it the exact same way. She don't like like in 2017, she said it was red, and then later on that year she changed it to blue. Then the next year it was rainbow colors. No, she didn't say it, the number was 23 in 2019, and then in 2020, 21, the number done changed to 200. No, if it was 23 then, it's 23 now. If it was six people then, <laughs> it's six people now. So, I mean, the fact that she remember names. I'm telling you people like this woman be remembering everything. So if she says she investigating stuff, she's looking into stuff, it really got to be some to it. Because not only that, this woman got documents upon documents upon documents. I don't care what I say. She be like, let me go find it. And then next thing I know, I got e email. Ding, 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 ding. She done send about 10, 12. I'm like, what the hell do she got a file cabinet of life? over there just everybody everything she done collected in life she got over there so the fact that she still got documents from 2003 january 13 2003 mind you fred rerun very pass in october 2000, 2003 he was still alive essie barry so when she mentions these ein numbers she showed me the documents where it was like a whole bunch of ein numbers they the the people that she i mean because essie is sending contacting sony she contacting banks and sure like the woman don't play games and they are responding back so it's not like she just frivolously frivolous frivolous just frivolous y'all know the word out there writing an email and nobody is responding oh no they respond back and she has those documents too so um in this um interview we are not showing everything oh no we're not doing that because the plan is to give you a little bit of the information, then for me to dig deeper and then have F Essie go in her file cabinet of life and then supply me with all the other information and documents. Because one thing that Miss Essie Berry always says, and if you've seen her before, you know she says this, it's not what I say. Is what I can prove. And when she says that, you can bet your last dollar, like Don Cornelius says, on Soul Train, that this woman got documents. Oh, she got receipts. Oh, she got the tea. Oh, she got the proof. Whatever you want to call it, she absolutely got it. So, um, girl, you said it was RSPA. So, are they trying to say, because this says... Because cause when you say that, I'm like, oh, okay. Because even though she done told me a lot of information, I mean, it's like so much that sometimes I forget something because it's just a lot of information. But so reading this, it says Suitland, RSPA, which she said is Fred Reron's company, has requested our office issue a direct payment. So they're saying that his company in June, June 13, 2003, when they received this, his company had requested a direct payment of $20 million, which the bank is saying that they had a good relationship since 1999, so they don't have a problem with issuing the $20 million. And they said the letter informed you that the bank will underwrite the direct payment letter of the... So, where is that money? I'm just inquiring minds want to... So I think that's what she's talking about when she say 20 million. Essie just like, so where the money at? So I know she started contacting people trying to figure out where the money at. So when you start, because I don't know if you already said it, but to get a better understanding. So when you started contacting people, asking them, okay, now where's this money at? They start saying what? The one broad said, fuck me. Who do I know who I think I was? Jackie. I wasn't going to see shit. It was a lot of money in the account. Um, she had a heart attack. So then I called a supervisor. Come to find out Kim Ray was her supervisor, but that was some broad, one of her friends. Kim Ray was the vice president of bb &T Bank in Washington. So over the years now, now if we don't play this, where's the 20 million? But over the years, my husband, if you go pull his network, it says $250 million. I was told that if you show that, that money exists somewhere. I was, and I know to today, and do I get residuals? Yeah, but it's the point of we, this ain't got shit to do with residuals. This had to put them underwriting that money and they took the money. 
And see, in 2013, why I did not get the money, Geneva, when I found out about everything, is because that's when we was going to reality show. I went to go find the cast. By the time I done found the cast and when it got Mary ass, Steve Ant had called me a co-conspiracy and an extortionist. Now, how the hell I'm going to come back up? Nobody knows my reputation. And I walk up and say somebody that took $20 million. But, and I found a woman. I found a bank teller who said they took the money. But by this time, Steve Harvey done called me a co-conspiracy and extortionist. So what the hell the media going to do? When you pull my name up, what did you see? So now what happens? That's why I was pissed. That's why I went after him because this shit was not about him or was not about Mary. I, in some ways, think that they may have could took Fred's life or did something shady, but I know damn well you took the money. I y'all can go tell BBT to call me. I'm saying that BBT is one of the raggediest ass banks that it is, and they're crooked. Jackie Peebly, um, uh, Kim Ray, and the other rug buckets that I got. This is the thing the eight bank accounts, they were all in Fred's names. The eight bank accounts, one of them had Sula Fest, one of them had R RSPA, which is Rerun School Performing Arts, RSPA, and all of them had different IE num EIN numbers. How the fuck y'all got a company and you got five to ten different EIN numbers on the bank accounts? I knew Fred bank account. I knew the one with Sula Fest and RSPA. I got five other bank accounts with five other EIN numbers with five other socials with my husband's name on them. But y'all can't tell me where it's at. And hell yeah, I got all of them proven. And you know what was really messed up? When you go in there and you fill out the bank cards, there was eight bank records, but you know how you sign the signature card when you open your bank account? At least five of those accounts didn't even have my husband's signature on them, but you said they was his accounts. And like somebody went in that side of his name to spread the accounts out. Each bank had a different account in it with a different EIN number. Okay, so my question to you is, when you seen all of these extra um, EIN numbers businesses, but you only technically knew about two of them, did you contact the manager and agent, you know, like his former manager and agent to find out what did they have to say about these businesses? Like, did he have these on the side and maybe you just didn't know about them? At that time, I didn't trust nobody in Hollywood because I see a lot of people lie. I like to be at face value. I did my own investigation. I contact them. I didn't like some of her answers. See, one thing you got to realize when y'all sign an agent, an agent will sign you the way for the rest of their life. If they sign a damn document in 2010, they think they still own you in 2020 and still be getting residuals and money off you. Um, me and his agent had kind of a conflict because they tried to like, I don't know if they think black people don't read or we don't research, but we do. I don't think you know that, but we do. We're not stupid. We have enough time to research it because so many has so much has been taken away from us through history. That's why I believe that God allowed me to be Fred's widow. See what people got to realize in life. Fred made his choice of his mates that he he married and he divorced. Right? He had how many ever six and he married and divorced them. I didn't have to worry about him doing that with me. God did it. Look at the dates. God knew that I would be the one to carry his legacy, to find out about all this corruption, to find out what happened to him, and then to tell his story. Who do you know is going to have paperwork from 1987? I have paperwork that Fred saved from himself from 1976 to 1987. He wrote his legacy. He wrote his story. He wrote his book before he even died because he loved himself. But I knew some of the other wives. I don't think they would have had the same compassion. I don't think they would have did the same thing. 20, I'm going to say 2005, y'all. I'm not quite sure. Maybe it was a little before then. I was asked to go to a studio in Hollywood um, to do a life story about Fred. This was right after he died. But this woman from, I think it was National Choir. She was the president. Or she was a high person up in there. She said, Essie, don't get your husband legacy away. Don't be in a rush to do anything. She said, just wait and sit. But I didn't know why she was telling me that. But I remembered those things she told me. It was on Melrose, wherever I went, y'all, because it's so long, certain things. I, I could get there if I needed to. I get to Melrose. I go into this studio. There's a whole lot of agents, producers there. 
So they give me this paper. In this paper, it said they wanted me to sign over my husband's legacy for $20 million. So now I'm thinking, is this the same $20 million that's over here and somebody's trying to get you? So what, what, I, what was I supposed to do? So I get in there, but I'm still Rerun's widow. But Fred got three kids, two sons and a daughter. So I would not sign that and make that type of decision knowing that he has a daughter and sons. So I wasn't going to sign anything. And then back of my man as a black woman, if you offer me 20 million, then that means it's more. I can make that off his legacy, off his life story alone, a movie, a documentary or whatever. So I'm not just going to sign his legacy away because you think that you can have a nice day. I saw a word on there. The word, whatever the word was, it meant to relinquish for the rest of your life. I called my friend, a guy named Clyde. I said, Clyde, what does this mean? He said, relinquish your rights for the rest of your life. I slid the contract back over to him. I told him to have a nice day. And I didn't trust shit with nobody else said after that. And then especially after I saw the police reports, the autopsy, I'm being called. Then I see that letter that Geneva just wrote, read. Then I read stuff. Then this girl's telling me that I wasn't going to see shit. She had a heart attack. A white man walking from the back of the bank to the front. His name's going to be Kim Ray. He's supposed to be a female, but he the vice president of the bank. I done lived some shit that people don't even know. And they had to retain all this in my mind. Even when I was fighting the case with Mary, I still had to retain what had went on with my damn husband, knowing this had went on. But because this dude did this, I couldn't even fight my, for my own husband's legacy. That's what that was about. We, ooh, we. So they were trying to play you. So they wanted you to sign over Fred Reron Berry. Pop locking the lockers, soul train, what's happening, everything else he done did for $20 million. And they thought that you was going to go for that. So that's how these meetings and stuff really be going. Like this whole story is just making sense. It's just coming together now. Just coming together. Oh, wow. $20 now, million. don't you know if I was money hungry as everybody has betrayed me to be? Don't you know if I was crooked as everybody? I could have signed that shit, went behind closed doors, changed my whole history of who I am, where I live and everything, and could have been somewhere sitting up, shutting up, shutting my mouth. It's never about the money with me. It's about the principle and the legacy. So I even when I want people to know this. So now you've heard the story. So stop damn telling me it was about Mary. That's the real deal. Shit was never about Mary. I fought like I fought, y'all, because I told you it just happened to my son, my husband. I fought like I fought because I went up to Washington and they want to play me not knowing that I was a black woman who read. And still to this day, I'll take on anybody in BBT. Bring your ass to the forefront because you know what happened. And that girl, Jackie Peebley, she wouldn't even know match for me. You want to sit up there and cry behind the closed doors. The person that y'all saw me calling out people on videos, I didn't just do that shit with Steve or whoever. I did that with anybody who crossed me the wrong way because I couldn't get the things done behind closed doors. That's why I took the YouTube because I had my own platform. But what better way would it have been for me to do a reality show and everything I'm telling y'all right now, I expose, expose everybody and, and it would be just what it was. I wasn't able to do that because I was accused of something that I didn't do. And I kept wondering in my mind, if this man's called me a co-conspirator, is he done called me an extortionist? How the hell am I going to go finish figuring out how they done took this $20 million? Because he had $5 million in the bank and they just walked away with my husband's shit. And then they turned around. I found out they were like giving raffles away. They took a city like Watts. And they made it into a Beverly Hills building with some of that $20 million. A guy named Jack B. Johnson. I know you know me, Jack. Jack B. Johnson went to jail behind that because I had started turning up people. And when you turn up people to the FBI, the FBI ain't going to tell you when you come get them. They're going to go get them and then tell you later. Him and his wife um, went to jail because they were issuing property. And so say a property is $50,000. But they're going to put a half a million dollars worth of assessments. These were the accounts that was connected to Fred Berry. So you got a $50,000 property, but you're going to put $1 million assessments on that shit? Why you didn't just go buy a million dollar mansion? So they were taking the money, trying to cover the money and building little cities up in Maryland, Suitland, Maryland, Washington. They even made up their own funding company. It looked like the funding company gave them the money when actually the money came through BPT off of 
off of reruns residuals. So forget what we're talking about now. That's the real deal since everybody want to damn tell my business that I wouldn't even fight for that shit. I looked at how this bank covered up and lied and how they told me my husband died. And then I had to sit up here and live with this shit for eight years up until today, knowing that all this happened. And I should have been fighting for my husband, his legacy, his family, and walked away from the rest of it. But unfortunately, because of Steve Harvey big my fast, I couldn't do that. I'm back calm now. Well, that's why we need a Lifetime movie of Frere Run Berry. Don't we want to see this Lifetime movie? A Lifetime? Yes, I know I do. They done did a new edition, Bobby Brown, Aaliyah, Whitney Houston. Where's the one of Frere Run Berry? Uh, Essie said that he started the lockers or helped to start the lockers. And, th and then some of them dancers. Them pop locking dancers, as he said, that Fred Rerun very created. We love him on the show. We know that he was one of the main members on the show. And when he wasn't on there, he was missed. Like, I noticed when when Rerun was not on the episode. Like, where the hell Rerun at? We want to see re people. We need to let them know that we need to see this Lifetime movie. And then another thing. So when we hear Miss Essie Berry saying all the time that... um. She owns her husband's legacy. Now we see what she's talking about when she say she owns her husband's legacy. She was married to him when she passed when he passed away. You heard her say that yes, she do get residuals. She owns all of this. I think she ain't want, been wanting to deal with certain people because of all the nonsense that she done dealt with after he passed away. But the story when she say that in 2013 she was just finding out this information about this cover up, the 20 million, you know, all of this stuff. Then this one, she, you know, came in, she was working on a show, then came into counter with Mary Harvey and then this whole Steve Harvey thing. And then that's where that kind of fell into place and why she was fighting so hard for that. Well, there was a few reasons why she was fighting hard for that, not only because of the co-conspirator and that part of it that she didn't like, but also because of the things that she had heard transpired over there with Steve Harvey. And by her already dealing with a celebrity, she already knew how the celebrity world was. So that's why we are going to do a part two and three with Miss Essie Berry. We will be doing a part two and three with Miss Essie Berry. And we're not skipping any days. We're not going to do the next one on Monday. Part two is coming tomorrow. And uh, part two, we will be talking about the whole Steve Harvey and Mary situation, everything that transpired with them, why she got into it, and things that maybe y'all haven't even heard of before. I'm going to ask her about just so you can get it out and we can talk about it. If y'all got any questions, ask the dang on questions. So, like, you know what I mean with, already with the Steve Harvey, Mary situation. And then part three on Sunday, saying back time same bet channel we will be coming back with essie berry's um current husband we will be coming back with miss essie berry current husband because remember she's been married four times we done already talked about three husbands here go the other one right here her former bodyguard uh, matter of fact, he is currently her bodyguard, former husband. They just divorced in 2019, but they still together. Yeah, whatever. But it, I, they ain't together, but whatever. They're still the best of friends. And I actually love Fred. I think that he's a cool guy. So we are going to have Fred Payne. Essie Berry's bodyguard that has been with her since after her divorce, I mean, since after the passing of Fred Rerun Berry, so he's another Fred, after Fred Rerun Berry, so he's been with her through all of that, and he's totally been with her through the whole Steve Harvey and Mary thing, so I totally want to hear how he feel <laughs> having to deal with her behind the scenes, you know, because you know, cause at the time she was driving me crazy, so I can just imagine how Fred was feeling, so we're going to have Fred in here, we're going to talk to him and get whatever he needs to say about Miss Barry, so yeah, girl, so what you guys say? Hey, um, I'm excited, um, I'm an open book. I love that Geneva did this. That way you guys will know. I gave you enough information, but it will be in a book. And we also got other things going on behind closed doors that has to do with Fred that I'm very excited about. We wanted to put a little bit out there because I don't need anybody telling my truth or anybody else's truth. I can tell my own truth. Oh, look at Mary. 
Um, I think that was in 2017. I also saw a comment where someone said that Ernest told a whole nother story. Well, Ernest would tell a whole nother story because he cowered out when they went to the meeting. Me and him ain't never kind of side eye to eye because he did some shady shit with Unsung. So please don't bring Ernie my way. We can talk if we want to, but I ain't trying to blow this, or this internet up behind him. I'm trying to stay kosher because there are things that I know about everybody behind closed doors that I ain't even brought out yet. Whether, whether who it is, and it may not, could not, but if Fred told me, then I will express it. You'll be your choice to prove whether it's a lie or the truth. So someone said that Ernest said it was a whole different story, saying that Fred wanted to be the star. Get the fuck about He was the star. What did y'all see that I didn't see? I'll wait. And then in 20, um, the second time around, when they went to What's Happening Now, they said he was the biggest star in that show and he should get more money. That's what was said. So whatever it is right now is whatever it is. They should have still remained friends. That's what happened. People get big heads around here. Everybody think they're more than the other. I never even did that when I was married. I still stayed to myself. Go, Geneva. It will be here tomorrow, same bat time, same bat channel. And y'all should know that because y'all are old school. You know that came from Batman and Robin. So that means tomorrow, Saturday at 7 o'clock Central Standard Time, which is 5 o'clock p.m. SE time over there on the West Coast. And um, here on Geneva's Closet, come back for part two. Essie Berry, we're going to be asking her questions about the whole Steve, Steve Harvey, Mary thing, whatever she want to say. Y'all got questions asked. Then on Sunday, this Sunday, same bat time, same bat channel at 7 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time. My time, 5 o'clock p.m. SC time over in the West Coast here on Geneva's Closet. We will have Fred Payne, Essie Berry's bodyguard slash ex-husband here to hear from him because he has also dealt with um, the whole trolling situation. Because we're going to ask Essie about that, too. All of this trolling. She's talking about people trolling and blah, blah, blah. We're going to ask her about that. And we're going to ask Fred about that. You know, and um, there are some things we're going to ask Essie about siblings. Because Essie has fam family members. Fred, her, her ex-husband, bodyguard, that Fred, Fred Payne, has family members that has got in cahoots with the whole trolling thing. Can you believe that? Can you believe what people will do? And we talking about grown people here. We ain't talking about no 17, 18, 25, not even 30 some. We talking about grown people sitting up here trolling and stuff and whatever. I'm just telling you, be here tomorrow to check out part two. Be here on Sunday to check out part three. Again, let me say this too while, while I'm on here talking. Let me say this too. Make sure you go check out, let me throw myself up here, Gift Girl T, Girl Gift Tees, Girl Gift Tees t-shirt, Girl Gift Tees t-shirt. We are uh, celebrating Black-owned entrepreneurs. She sent me the shirt, 100% chance that I don't care, because that's how I be feeling the majority of the time. I done stuck the link in here a few times. After this video is done, I'm going to stick the link in there. Make sure you go and support her. She said all of her shirts are basically $20 and under, five days. She's shipping the stuff out. She do custom-made shirts to be a graduation, reunion, whatever, a baby shower, or whatever. She can custom-make them, or she just got really nice. Because she didn't custom-make this. This is just... This is what she does. And her name is Ty, T-I-G-H-E. And again, support Black-owned businesses, girl gift tees. And it fits good. And, and let me say this. I have purchased shirts from Girl Gift Tees. And Ty, the owner, has gave me shirts. And those shirts that I have both purchased and she gave me, I still have to this day. The collar ain't all hanging. Shirt stretched out. Color is still on the shirt. Love them. Fit me well. She have them in guy sizes, you know, because some girls like boy tees or girl tees. She have them both ways. But I highly recommend her. I highly recommend Girl Gift Tees. So you should totally go and check her out. And if you purchase anything from her, tell her that I sent you. And let me know how you feel about the products. Because any Black-owned entrepreneur that I promote here in Geneva's Closet, and you actually do use their service, I would like to know about it. Because if it's a service or something, a product or something that you did not like, then I want to know so I can contact the entrepreneur and say, oh, the people didn't like it. And then so 
I know that maybe I don't want to advertise them and stuff anymore. You know, I just don't want to be bringing anybody, just any old body up in here for you all. So please, if you use anybody's services or purchase anything from them, please let me know. And another entrepreneur that I want to give a shout out to is I just entrepreneur, um, just did an interview with them, Dr. Chanel Phillips. She is the owner of FTE Holistic Health. She is a life strategist, community psychologist, a yoga instructor, and doula. She gave me really good information. You should totally go check her out. Her website is FTE slash this slash essentials dot net. FTE slash essentials.net but i'll also put her information down there too and the other entrepreneur is rena's creative travel she's a travel agent look try look it's travel time i just came back from vegas i did a whole week look i needed a break and y'all may need a break too and you might not want to know where to go where to purchase plane tickets whatever you can contact rena's creative travel or you can email her at rena's creations with an s and thanks t-h-a-n-g-z at gmail.com rena r-i-n-a creations c-r-e-a-t-i-o-n-s and a-n-d thanks t-h-a-n-g-z at gmail.com now let me bring miss barry back on girl this was a this was a good interview do we do we have any questions miss barry queen taylor christina won't you to sing something i don't know what you done sung they want you to sing girl look i don't know what you gonna do ma what what why you gonna put me on the spot like that I was getting ready to answer a few of these questions right quick, if y'all don't mind. Can I do that first? Then I'll put some, you know, at the end. So, because I don't want y'all thinking that Geneva don't pay attention. And while y'all ask these damn questions, Geneva going to be on the spot too. Yeah, do it, Geneva. <laughs> yes. I like that she jabbing on <laughs> Okay, listen. Oh, I like that dance in the background. Girl, give us a play while we back here doing this jazz. Yes, baby. Okay, some of these questions, y'all. I, I said I'm an open book, but y'all, y'all pushing it. So, um, that man race would you date? They someone asked, besides black men, what race would I date? I don't know because I ain't dated out my race. I've never dated before. I've always been married. So even to start dating, I'm gonna start dating, um, uh, maybe, but I've never dated out my race. I just told y'all that the first time I was married, I told you 15, so we got that one. Um, I made a statement one day on a video. People ask me why I don't slow dance with men. I would slow dance with a man, but I would have to know that man in a club or something. I can't just be in a club and slow dance with a dude because it make me seem like you're sleeping on the floor. You're screwing on the floor. I don't need a nigga rubbing his body up all on me and stuff like that getting turned on. So I'm not even going to do that. That's why I've never slow danced in a club. And I'm tired of this and I ain't going to say it no more. If y'all ass don't remember this question, I'm not going to say it no more because I'm offended because you keep asking me. Somebody want to know my height. I need to know why you want to know. That's what I need to know. But if you just got to know, do I need to show my ID? I'm four foot nine. There it is. Don't ask me no more because anybody else asks me, I'm going to say five, one, five, two, five, three, period. I'm two feet from being a dwarf. Okay. Live with it. What was the next one? If it was a celebrity, who would I date? No one. That part. They say, if you had a choice, Essie, to date a celebrity, who would you date? I ain't going to lie. I'm not celebrity stricken because he got to come with some suave, just like I come with some suave because he a celebrity don't mean he got what I need. You dig what I'm saying? So I'm just, I don't know. What was the next one? Um, it was in this phone. Let me ask you. I think we answered it. Um, someone asked me, what would I buy? Give them three things that I would buy if I went shopping. What I really like, so I'm gonna keep it real. Perfume, lingerie. It I it ain't really say materialistic wise. Um lingerie. Now um I don't know comfortable clothes, but them two for sure. 
I love perfume and I love lingerie. I'm a big fanatic in that. When I dress, I dress. Someone else asked, why I don't wear makeup? Because I don't want to. If you don't see any of my pictures, you can see me with makeup. I look made up. I don't really like to look made up because I have moles on my face. You can't cover uh, makeup with them moles, but it's okay either way. Um, but I just don't do it. But when y'all see me made up, y'all going to know Ashley Berry made up from head to toe. I like to be simple other than that. Um, now, I know a dude wrote this and asked me this. I don't really know why. I may turn you on. He, they want to know how do I walk around the house whichever way I want to. How about that? If I want clothes, I have clothes. If I want lingerie, I have. If I want to walk around naked, I'll walk around naked. How about that? So I, those were a few other questions. Um, and would I date out my race at this point in my life? I might would because uh, I've never done it. But I'm just saying we're going to talk more about that as well. But those are just a few of the questions. And I took one more. I'm going to take this one more because I've made a picture of it. Uh, I made a picture of it so I could read it. Shaquita say, do you stay in touch with Fred children? What did you meet your first husband? Where were you born? I think I answered that. I was born in Georgia, between Columbus, Georgia, and somewhat in Detroit. Chicago is my son's um, family member's home, but they are all my family. So I go up there. My first visit to Chicago was in 2019 when I saw Geneva. Um I don't keep in touch with Fred children because I got to deal with the mamas if I do that. But I do keep it with his daughter, Portia. Um, and where I met my first husband, I met him in a project called Elizabeth Candy in Columbus, Georgia, where we used to roll and kick it. So y'all got more questions, put them down. We'll do it at the end of the next video. I really enjoyed this video. I hope you guys got... Um, so completion on some things I said, it's a lot of stuff that's going to be in the book, you guys, because it's too much for me to explain to you because of the things that I've already transpired and the things I went through in the last four years. So it was a lot. So I'm really right now just getting back to myself as well. And someone else asked me about changing my hair. I think, you know, why I changed my hair now because you never asked you about me, about me being a master cosmetologist. And um, my hair now um, is locked. I, I, Geneva, I got jealous. I ain't gonna lie. Geneva had been wearing her little locks on to show. She all the base about sha sha. My hair and the wear blowing through my my hair in Vegas, baby. I ain't gonna put on the wig. I just can feel. I got jealous. I was like, let me see how this this thing go and i love it and i'm not finished with it but i'm locking it so this will be my hairdo i'll change if i want to put something on but i ain't gonna lie you always got to try something new i'm 50 years old i don't want to keep doing hair when i seen geneva she made me want to lock mine too so this is my work and this is my lock and i'm still doing a little bit more but i'm going natural on you geneva and god bless you guys too for everybody who joined us Come on through, lock crew. Y'all better come on through, 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 through. Because look, now let me say this. Yes, I got the pony. Uh, you know, because when I knew I was going to Vegas, I was like, well, let me just buy some hair or just in case we go out somewhere. So I bought two hairs. I bought this one and I bought another one. But to be perfectly honest with you, I only put this hair on, I think, once. And I only put the other one on once. And I was wearing my own hair because ain't nothing like, won't he do it? Matter of fact, when we come on tomorrow, I'll just wear my own hair because ain't none like just being natural. Let me just say this because I know that this interview was all about Essie, but let me just kind of end it with this. You know, because ladies, all the time, we got to be worried about these lace fronts, French braiding your hair, them sewing stuff and gluing stuff and even even them braids. I mean, that tugging at your hair and stuff and your head hurting for two and three days with them heavy weave all on your head. Sometimes we get tired of it. And I had got tired of it. I had tried the weaves. I'm not even good with lace fronts. I struggle with the baby hairs and stuff. Just, just struggling all over the place. I done tried the braids. I'm tender headed. My head hurt it. I, I, y'all know I even tried the scarves. I was tying them too tight. It was snatching out my edges and stuff, stuff because I was wearing the scarves too much. 
so then I, I, I Ben said I was only going to do natural. Ben stopped putting a perm in my hair, but then I swim all the time. So then I just couldn't figure out what to do with my hair. And it's just, it's just a lot. So then when I finally realized that I needed to try the locks out and got the locks, it was the best thing I had ever did because all I had ever did for years for years was daydream on how it would feel to have the air and the wind blow on my scalp, my scalp, not the weave, <laughs> not, not, not with the braids, but to feel my own hair blow in the wind. So let me tell y'all something. I just have to throw this out there right quick. The other day, because another dream I have also daydream is driving in my car because I have a drop top car and then the wind blowing in my hair. Now, when I was daydreaming about this, I didn't know how my hair would be. I was sitting up there like, so am I going to have a weave in my hair and the wind going to be blowing the weave? Is it going to be some braids? Am I going to put a wig on? Am I going to have a natural? Am I going to be and got my hair flat ironed or something that's blowing in the wind? So like we just got summertime, just able to put the car down, put, put the top down on my car the other day like two weeks ago, I put the top down, driving in the car, and tell me why the wind blew and my hair blew to, I said, won't he do it, Jesus? Won't he do it, Lord? I, that was the thing that I have been envisioning for years. So I know for some of y'all, it may seem so simple, just so not like really Geneva, that's what it was. But for me, it is everything to finally be able to be myself. These are my natural nails too, just to let you know, because you're probably like the length, it got to be fake. It just has to be fake. No, these are all my real nails. I have real nails, real hair. Ain't nothing like it. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Another thing. Uh, so Essie hair looks beautiful i i love her hair and when i and when she popped on camera today and i said i was like girl those them locks it looked like a little curly little duma you better stop playing with them look at her she better stop showing off and whatnot but then again she is a master cosmetologist not just a cosmet no a master and i never understood why she said master until she started sending me them pictures i'm talking about them hair shows then it all made sense. Another thing that I want to say is, again, if you would like to advertise your business in Geneva's Closet, you can email me at genevascloset22 at gmail.com. Come in here, advertise your business. And I want to tell you this also, people, because a lot of people here on YouTube, or when, when they do videos, period, and they get ready to come on, they do a timer thing of five minutes, 10 minutes. I'm not doing no timer. And the reason why I'm not doing the timer is because a lot of people do that for live videos, but the video is live once. It's on replay always. So I'm focused on the replay. So when the video pops on, we on and popping. So there is no five minute, 10 minute wait for y'all to get up in here. Make sure you put your notifications on. Make sure you remember that we will be back tomorrow and Sunday at seven o'clock for part two and part three with Miss Essie Berry. So Miss Essie Berry, is there anything that you would like to say before we end this? And, and again, people, if y'all have any questions that we missed, Email me at genevascloset22 at gmail.com or you can email Essie at civil rights activist Essie Barry is down there at the bottom at gmail.com. But um, Ms. Barry, anything else you would like to say, ma'am? Thank you guys for joining us. It was a pleasure. Um, Geneva, I want to thank you to really the fullest because there's something about you that makes me open up and want to be able to express. For a long time, I didn't want to share my husband's story with nobody because it was more severe than people even thought. To go through the years that I went through and the burdens that I had to carry, knowing that I didn't fight for him like I fought for other people, and knowing this had happened to my husband, now it's time for me to get back focused on Essie and her life and things she's doing. And so many things are positive happening behind closed doors. It's just what it is. And I'm looking forward to these other two lives the next two nights. I'm really looking forward to the part, part three um, with my bodyguard, because I don't really know what he gonna say, how he gonna say it. Um, but I can say with that is, um, me and him are very good friends. We will always be friends. I mean, he's like family to me. You guys will get to hear whatever he says and I'll have to live with it. I am an open book and I don't expect for someone to say things just to like make me feel something I'm not. I already know who I am and I'm a hell and a force to be work reckoned with at the same time. But I just truly thank Geneva so much because she gave me back that sense of, Geneva gave me back a sense of comfort 
to know me that I can can really trust sisters, that I can look in a sister's face and know that if I talk to her behind closed doors or we do something, it's not going to change. To me, she's just not a YouTuber. She's just not a blogger, y'all. She's way more than that. Do you know how many years, if you just think about what I just said, that I carry what I've just told you about my husband? Y'all going to hear some shit about Missy Elliott. It's so many things. Missy Elliott, I love you, though that I've read through in the past that people don't even know about. So now me and with Geneva too, there's so many extraordinary things as a friend, an individual, an entrepreneur, a person. Like I went through her videos today and I saw Geneva on the, the beach with her daughter doing that look. I said, is this girl breaking it down? I mean, I just love everything about her because realness like that doesn't exist every day. And she made me allow me to know that Essie, it is okay to trust. And she's very protective of me. And I thank her for that because sometimes my heart is so big that I open doors and some people that I should not have opened doors to. And if y'all see people attacking me on the internet or talking about things, okay. But that's because of Geneva that I done shut my damn mouth. I'm gonna keep it real. You know what I'm saying? I, I had to listen. I had to pay attention. So it doesn't matter tomorrow, today, the next day, what somebody say about you. Know who you are. Know your worth. Know your value. Can't nobody tell your truth better than you. At first, I was upset and ready to attack everybody. No, she didn't make a video. I don't give a damn what you made. Because when you hear it out my mouth, you know it's the truth. When you hear it out somebody else's mouth besides Geneva, you know it ain't the truth. And that right there, 100% chance. You guys, like, share, and subscribe. That sister, any black promote business that we can get, I'll get one shirt just to do that. When you open a door for one black entrepreneur, you open it for a lot. And we're going to, after we get through with these interviews right here, and Geneva get to do what she's going to do, we're going to come back and we talk about things because it was something I watched the other night. It was about the Black Wall Street. That shit was vicious to me because there's so many times that people are trying to stop black people with opportunities. We stop ourselves with opportunities by coming against each other. We have to know the mentality now about coming against each other. Somebody put in the box, Essie, what this blogger, what's she talking about with you? Anybody who know Essie Berry on this internet know I could cut you down with my mouth and tear you to pieces and probably make you have a nervous breakdown. That was Essie four years ago. This is a new Essie now. Will I trigger every now and then? Maybe I will. But some people, you're not even worth my time. You're not even worthy or valuable enough to waste my time with my cute energy to say something about you. I don't look like this at 51 because I let people stress me and worry about what they talk about me. You heard my life. You heard my story. Now you know why I am so raw like I am. Now you know why I stand like I stand because I had to stand for myself all my life because all I had was me and God. And he sent me people like Geneva and other people around me to give me that strength. And let me let you, y'all, you subscribers know before I go. I may not have known you. I may not see your face. I may not even ever get to hear your voice but i don't know if other people do it or even people who's on these youtube streets but for every person that tune into geneva and essie i thank you for every person that listened to my word and i make one person stronger i thank you i will never get so big that i don't understand where i came from that's why i'm still here today i don't lose train of thought because I was married to celebrity because I'm still who I am today. That will never change. And I want people to know that. But I want you to know just as well as y'all feel or think like I'm a celebrity. I feel like every damn body that logs into this table, every time they open, they might listen to me in Geneva. Y'all my celebrities. Y'all my strength. Y'all kept me strong. Like we going to keep y'all strong. This is what this is about. It's a journey now from 2021 on y'all. Ain't no more looking back. Ain't no more lies being told. I don't have to worry about proving who I am. Y'all saw who I was in these last four years, and now you know. And I just want to thank you guys, too, because you guys help us be able to communicate, and you allow us to know that we're touching your lives. And I really appreciate y'all for that. All y'all go jumping on all these other people pages. If they don't tell y'all, thank you for watching them. I thank everybody who clicked that damn link. Like, subscribe, share every time y'all tune in and i'd be happy i'd be like damn is my sisters here because it's like a family now a lot of these bloggers doing it 
but they don't even know your damn names. They don't even call out your names. We'll let you know that. We need to let people know who you are and what you stand for. Because without subscribers, even fans, we wouldn't be who we are. So much gracious and love to all my subscriber, my celebrity subscribers. Thank you and much love. Absolutely. We're about to get ready to go. That was just funny because Queen Taylor Christina is not funny. Queen, maybe maybe we might get her to sing tomorrow. So this would be a thing to make sure that you come you back. Miss me. I know you miss me. I know you miss me, but I bye. <laughs> okay now. Okay, well see. You got a little bit of chug a lugging right there. You got a little bit of chug a lug. Come back tomorrow. You never know why, what may happen, Queen Taylor Christina. She may get it in for you tomorrow. But anyway, people, I thank you so much. Like Miss Barry said, we really appreciate you for um, you all for joining us today. We really thank the people in the comment section for communicating with us. We really do appreciate it. We hope that we were able to answer some of your questions. If not, like, again, email us, contact us. Be here tomorrow, Sunday. We'll see you later, people. We love talking to you. And uh, what do I usually say? um please make sure you like and share this video and subscribe to geneva's closet if you haven't already done so right here on youtube and you can follow me on facebook at what at geneva's closet and you can email me at geneva's closet 22 at gmail.com you all have a fabulous day and i'll talk to you later bye